Hey everyone. Welcome back to the third and final part of Never Cut Twice. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons for your immense support. I really wouldn't be able to make any of these videos without you guys. There is about 12 or 13 other stories for you guys to enjoy over there. If you guys ever want to send me a message to ask any questions, or simply just chat, feel free to do so. Link to that is in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 27, Stop Being a Weenie. Well, well, well. Naruto's mind, deeply in sleep though it was, reacted to those words like a cold bucket of water, but he kept his eyes shut tight and spoke softly, Hello Itachi, when did you get back? Oh, just now. Naruto could hear the amusement dripping from his voice, you two certainly look, cozy. What time is it? Just past three. Naruto groaned and slowly started to move, which of course immediately woke Tamari. The two were back on their feet in seconds and, after a few yawns, fully awake. Naruto stretched and then suddenly noticed something odd, what's with all that crap you have, Itachi? The Uchiha was holding numerous boxes of many sizes, all filled with stuff, that's why I'm here, I got tired of carrying all this around. Rubbing the sleep out of her eyes, Tamari leaned forward, but what is it all? I managed to get some free stuff from just walking around, then found an underground casino. I kept playing and kept winning, but decided to stop half an hour ago since I had almost more than I could carry. I plan to go back there now that I've dropped this stuff off. Oh. With a wave, Itachi vanished. Well, Tamari said bluntly, that was rather embarrassing. Could have been much worse. How do you mean? It could have been Kisame that found us like that. Tamari opened her mouth to argue, then closed it again and thought about it, okay, you have a point there. Actually, Naruto said, it's probably a pretty good thing Itachi dropped by, or we might have been late for the movie. May, we have half an hour yet. Naruto looked at her curiously, how come you fell asleep, anyway? You had just woken up. Well, actually she said hesitantly, you fell asleep a while before me. Then what were you doing all that time? Nothing. Crickets chirped in the background. Really? Yes, really. More crickets. If you say so. With that, Naruto went over to clean up the forgotten lunch dishes, but Tamari suddenly spoke really quickly, okay, I'll admit it. I noticed something while you were asleep that seemed strange, and it's been bugging me ever since. How come you don't have any scars? Naruto stopped and looked at her, huh? Scars, she held out her arm to illustrate, all shinobi get hit sometimes and so most are covered in scars, even Itachi has some, but not you. Why? Answering this question required Naruto to dredge up the memory of a conversation he had had with the QB some time ago, because I don't heal, I regenerate. I know you heal fast, but there should still be a scar. No, Naruto corrected her, healing and regenerating are two completely different things. Healing is when your body replaces destroyed or damaged tissue with new tissue. Regenerating is when your body replaces damaged tissue with the same tissue. Um, what? It's hard to explain to some who can't do it. Naruto pondered and was suddenly struck by inspiration, okay, you and Konkuro are siblings, right? Yes. But you're not the exact same. The two of you have the same parents, but there are many differences between the two of you. That's how healing is, the new flesh is similar to the old, but not quite the exact same. Now regenerating on the other hand could be compared to a set of identical twins. Not only do they have the same parents, they are physically identical in every way. So then when you get hurt, your body replaces the material with flesh completely identical to what was damaged? Exactly. Regenerating isn't very common, since it's pretty much a demon thing, but theoretically, I could even regenerate whole limbs with enough time and chakra. Tamari was silent for a moment, so you could get a tattoo, and then when you were sick of it, cut off your arm, grow a new one, and get a different tattoo? Naruto sweat dropped, yes. Dash. Their movie was on at quarter past four, so they left camp at about 3.30. Before they left, Naruto went over everything the QB had told him. Flashback. Okay Brad, since you seem too serious about this, you'll have to follow a few basic rules. No problem, give them to me straight. You're going to have to not be an idiot. You often don't remember to do things like think before you speak. Fine then, but let's try to avoid the personal insults from now on, shall we? Technically, you're going on a date with a coworker so the same rules apply. No discussing anything shinobi-like and no bringing weapons. But, what if Tamari brings her weapons? She won't. But. She won't. 
But. Good God, she won't bring any weapons. How can you be so sure? You live as long as me, you learn a few things. Now do you want my help or not? Yes. Then shut your mouth and listen. Naruto shut his mouth. Now, as I was saying. I know this might be a stretch for you, but you should try and work on your charm. Charm? Yes, charm. It's not hard, it just requires you to think in a different way than you usually do. Explain. Being charming means smiling, using what little wit you possess, and that sometimes you need to do something, often something frivolous, for someone even though you know they're fully capable of doing it themselves. That sounds dumb, but I know what you mean. Good. You again prove that you are, in fact, smarter than you look. Naruto was tiring of the fox, is that it? No. Most important of all, you have to learn to be less of a weenie. Remember the personal insult thing? Yes, but I don't care. You need to stop being a weenie. No girl is going to respect someone who has a phobia of physical contact. May I remind you that my being so screwed up is mostly your fault? Again, I don't care. And just so we're absolutely clear on this, if you don't keep up your half of this bargain I'm going to kill you in your sleep, and consequences be damned. Yeah, yeah, very scary. To my immense surprise, you've been pretty useful today, so don't worry about your reward. And remember, brat, no weeniness. Go to hell. And flashback. As they were just about to leave, Tamari was slightly shocked when, before she even suggested it, Naruto said he was planning on leaving his sword behind. She was again surprised when he suggested they walk instead on run, and doubly so when he asked to hold her hand. By the time they actually reached the theater, she was starting to wonder whether this was really Naruto. They arrived with plenty of time, but wanted good seats, so Naruto gave Tamari money to buy snacks while he got tickets. Tamari considered her many snack options and turned to the greasy man behind the counter, large popcorn please, and two root beers. The man wiped his greasy hands on his greasy shirt and grabbed the popcorn scoop. What are you going to? Jaws, since it's supposed to be really good. Aye, it is, but you might find it a bit strange today. Curious, Tamari grabbed her popcorn, how? Well, this strange bluish guy came in this morning and bought tickets to every single showing today. Even weirder than that, the guy always cheers for the shark, rather loudly I might add. A couple people have even left the theater because he disturbed them so much. Going white, Tamari bolted to where Naruto was just about to buy tickets, Naruto. Changed my mind, let's go too, she looked quickly to see what else was on right then, Harry Potter meets Godzilla. Naruto blinked, okay then, no problem. Minus two hours of melodrama later. Naruto and Tamari walked out of the theater in a kind of daze. Well, Naruto said dryly, I was right about those movie makers being clever. By the time Godzilla showed up, I was ready to rip into those whiny wizards myself. Well, it certainly was an, experience. Speaking of which, Naruto suddenly asked curiously, how come you didn't want to go to Jaws? I heard a rumor that someone strange was in the theater and was causing problems. Ah well, I guess we'll need to see Jaws some other time, you hungry? Yeah, kinda Tamari said a bit self-consciously, having hoped that her rumbling stomach hadn't been loud enough to hear. So what do you feel like eating then? I don't know, why not find a seafood place? We are in water country after all. Sure, though I can't imagine seafood can get better than that fish Itachi made. That's because you've eaten nothing but junk your whole life. Hey, instant ramen is good. Tamari rolled her eyes, instant ramen barely qualifies as food. Fine then, you pick where we eat and then we'll see if I think it's better. Deciding to humor him, Tamari found a convenience store and grabbed a tourism book, passing the man behind the counter a few coins. Going back outside to where Naruto was waiting, she brandished the book like a weapon, you better prepare yourself, because today your concept of food will be blown away. Dash. Sasuke wandered back and forth in his hotel room nervously, his dinner long since forgotten. He tensed when felt someone at the door, but calmed when Kabuto slid quietly into the room, any sign? No, Sasuke-sama. There don't appear to be any cloud nin in the city. Fine, but this will be the last night we spend in town. How did your intel gathering go, anything new? Not really, this Mamoru is a tough customer. All his ex-employees are so afraid of him that I couldn't get so much as the name of his wife out of them. This probably goes without saying, but you were discreet in your questioning, I hope. Of course, not a one of them suspects I was anything more than a nosy reporter. Dropping onto his bed, Sasuke stared vacantly at the ceiling, so, 
we're going to just have to go to the estate ourselves and see what we can find out. Looks that way, Sasuke-sama. What did I tell you about doing that? Doing what, Sasuke-sama? Adding Sasuke-sama to the end of your sentences. I thought I told you to stop that. You did, Sasuke-sama. Then why haven't you stopped? It would be too disrespectful, Sasuke-sama. Okay, now you're just doing it to annoy me. I would never, Sasuke-sama. I can't even imagine going out of my way to annoy you, Sasuke-sama. Don't you know that, Sasuke-sama? Sasuke shifted his gaze to Kabuto, see, the thing is, I can't tell if you're being serious or not. Why would I not be being serious, Sasuke-sama? Never mind. Dash. Naruto looked at the restaurant Tamari had chosen with a detached sense of awe. You plan to eat here? Yeah, why not? It's, so fancy. It's a sushi restaurant, Naruto. There's nothing fancy about sushi. I've never been to a place like this before. Which is why we're going, now come on. Sitting down, Naruto grabbed his menu and began to read with fervor, while Tamari casually glanced through hers. Once their order finally was taken, Naruto almost collapsed, man, it was really hard to decide. Only because you acted like the fate of the world depended on what you ordered. I had to be sure I made the right decision. You do realize that if you really wanted to, we could come here again tomorrow. Actually, he hadn't realized that. Feeling foolish, Naruto searched for a subject change, I was pondering something earlier. Why do people think movies make good dates, anyway? Because they don't require any interaction. But doesn't that eliminate the purpose of going on a date? Yes. But people like nice passive activities since they eliminate the need for such inconveniencing things as conversation. Are most people really that shallow? Tamari shrugged, it's just human nature. Remember the first girl you had a crush on? If you think back to it now, what was the crush based on? Naruto hung his head, point taken. It was while Naruto was looking at the ground dejectedly that he suddenly felt something tickle his senses. Not wanting to needlessly cause anyone alarm, he lifted his head back up and his gaze scanned the nearby tables in what he hoped was a casual kind of way. Three tables to his right, there was an old man sitting with middle-aged woman, and Naruto's eyes were drawn to the pair. It seemed to him at first to be nothing more than a woman going out to dinner with her father, as neither looked particularly strange, but there was something about the old man. At that same table, the woman was getting nervous, Father, that boy is staring at us. Don't look. He felt my chakra, just a moment ago. How? It's perfectly masked. I sneezed. When you sneeze every bodily function stops for a fraction of a second, and during that fraction of a second I lost control and he sensed the chakra that leaked through. Impossible. I didn't feel a thing. Well that, the old man said while stroking his chin, is because your senses are not yet well enough attuned. He is young, father. There is no way someone of his age could have such perception. Ah, but you assume too much. Let us go, we shall eat somewhere else. But do we really have to go? The old man glanced sideways at Naruto, yes. Naruto watched as the old man pulled a huge walking stick from under the table and stood up, at which point his daughter helped steady him and they walked out of the building. Then, there was a hand being waved in front of his face, hello? Earth to Naruto. What? Oh, sorry. Was just a little distracted. Tamari hummed, yes, you were. What was up with those two people? I'm not sure, and really, I don't care. So I can get to interrogating you about relationships now? It's not like there's anything to tell. I'm not sure why, but every girl I knew was either stupid, weak, or more likely, both. Tamari searched her blurry memory of time she had spent in Konoha, they didn't seem quite that bad, except that Sakura girl, she always pissed me off. The effect on Naruto was immediate. His muscles tightened, his pupils narrowed, and he half snarled, I'm not even going to think about her. Even bastard Sasuke worked and improved himself, but Sakura has never been anything more than pathetic. Even worse, she uses cruelty to mask her own uselessness. She sounds like a bitch. Yeah, that's about right. She was one of the main reasons I left the stupid village in the first place. That, however Tamari said with a smirk, is most definitely her loss. Dash. The old man walked down the street with a sense of urgency, his daughter trailing behind. Growing impatient with his lack of explanation, she grabbed his arm, geez, dad. What's going on? We're going to see the Poobah. What? Why? Because, 
I think that boy might be far more that he seems, and if anyone in this city would know about any powerful shinobi in the area, it would be the Puba. Setting a brutal pace, he burst into the city's central tower only minutes later, making the lady at the desk jump, can I help you, sir? The old man, who looked fine, compared to his heavily breathing daughter, smiled in the wizened way that old men do, please tell the Puba that Sark and Seraphim are here to see him. I'm sorry sir, but he doesn't take guests this late. Sark rubbed his head, ah, I'm sorry then, for not being specific. In that case, tell him that a swordmaster of Hidden Mist is here with his daughter. The desk clerk's face went ashen th, th, those names again, sir? Sark and Seraphim. I'll tell him right away. Dash. When Naruto and Tamari finally got their food, they had been waiting so long that they both ate like they were starved. Naruto ate with such excessive speed that he didn't even taste his first few bites. When he slowed down a little bit, the first taste hit his tongue, crap, this stuff is really awesome. I hate it that you're always right. The faster you get used to it, the easier your life will be. Naruto spared her an amused glare between bites, but only for a second. Tamari was quite hungry herself, and so their meal went on in relative silence. When there was no more food to be found, Naruto laid back in his chair, ah, that was tasty. I need to try some more new kinds of food. But later, because I'm going to explode if I eat any more. Like you said, there's always tomorrow. It worries me that you sound so enthusiastic. Naruto reached into his wallet and pulled out a few bills, how much should we tip? Some people say a percentage of the meal price, but I just say give the server whatever you think he or she deserves. Leaving 2,000 yen for a tip, Naruto stood up, ready to go? Sure, it's actually getting pretty late. As they left the building, Naruto suddenly realized Tamari was right, the sun had already set. The night made the walk back seem surreal, as the only light came from flickering streetlights and a sliver of the moon. They turned a corner and were suddenly hit by a cold wind, causing Tamari to shiver, how come you never seem bothered by the elements? Aren't you just full of questions today? Once I get a chance to examine you, I notice all this neat stuff and then I get curious, she pointed at where their hands were interlocked, my hand is cold, but yours is warm despite the wind and the low air temperature. I don't know exactly how my body does it, but my temperature almost never changes. It has something to do with my chakra system and body composition, both of which are different than, say, yours. What did you do to yourself, anyway? Force near lethal amounts of demonic chakra through my system. I knew you were crazy, but that might be a record. Nah, it's worked out pretty well for me in the end. As well as being, as you put it, neat, there are major advantages to having a body like mine, and even now I'm not even sure I've figured all of them out yet. Tamari suddenly grabbed his arm and hugged it to her chest, okay then, I'm borrowing some of your body heat. Even as most of Naruto was getting nervous, a little voice in his head repeated weenie, 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 and he willed himself to calm down. Once he cooled his head, he actually quite enjoyed the contact, as it gave him a warm fuzzy feeling in his gut. It was in this way that they continued back to camp, neither really feeling the need to talk anymore. Once they passed the city limits and entered the forest, the night became almost pitch black. It was times like this that for Naruto, the world truly came alive. He closed his eyes and let his other senses take over, smelling, tasting, hearing and feeling the forest. Even without sight, he felt no fear, as he was fully aware of his surroundings. It was nice, he mused, to use his advanced senses to just enjoy his surroundings. He could hear Tamari's heartbeat, the scratching of small animals, and the rustling of leaves as if amplified by hundreds of small hidden microphones. It was not, he mused a moment later, the most emotional or dramatic simile, but it was accurate. They stopped about a half mile from camp and Tamari seemed annoyed about something. Not wanting to cause trouble, Naruto remained quiet until she spoke. We have a dilemma. What kind of dilemma? See, often the success of a date can be determined by whether the guy offers to walk the girl home to her door. We live in the same place. Exactly. And this is a dilemma? Yes, it is. Looking down at her slightly pouting face in the moonlight, a maelstrom slowly brewed in Naruto's belly. He wanted more than anything to go for it, but his body was frozen. Weenie. In that one moment, his inhibitions were shattered. Pivoting on his right foot, he wrapped his free arm around her waist and kissed her with everything he had. Tamari squeaked in surprise, but didn't make any move to push him away, and slowly started to kiss him back. In the world of kisses, this one was rather clumsy, neither of the participants having much experience, but it had a certain illogical wonder about it, 
not unlike that of a young child's first spoken word. When they broke apart, the warm fuzziness he had felt earlier was back, replacing the maelstrom that had been churning Naruto's stomach only moments before, I think that was a good enough indication that our first date was a success. Tamari rallied her confidence and grabbed his shoulder, actually, I don't think I quite got the message the first time. Dash. Back at camp, Kisame sat surrounded by Jaws memorabilia, what are those two doing out there? They haven't moved for five minutes now. Itachi looked up, do you want to be the one to go check? And maybe walk in on something? I never said anything about going to check, but I am curious. Itachi sorted through the box of stuff he had won gambling, think of it this way, if we don't actually know what they're doing, we can just assume whatever we want. Kisame grinned, and, of course, mocked them ceaselessly about it. Exactly. Chapter 28, Giggity Giggity Gig. Walking into camp, Naruto felt a strange unease. Itachi sat examining piles of stuff and Kisame was reading a book about sharks, but Naruto sensed something sinister in the air. Tamari seemed oblivious to the atmosphere and wandered curiously over to Itachi, what did you win at gambling? Anything good? The Uchiha shrugged, I now own a mansion on the north end of town, a summer house by the sea, a company that builds shingles, a horse named Tabasco, the patent of an invention that slices bagels, a candy store, and some guy's wife. That's only the stuff worth big bucks, the rest is in boxes that I need to sort through. Tamari sat next to him and peered over his shoulder, a man bet his wife? Yeah. Actually, it was the same guy who I got the horse from, and he bet his wife before he would bet his horse. You started with almost nothing, so how'd you manage that kind of profit? I just play card games, which I can win it easily. Isn't that cheating? How is having better eyesight and a better memory than everyone else cheating? I guess it's not, but it still doesn't seem right. Naruto flopped onto his sleeping bag, I figure morality is beside the point, since Itachi, you have no use for anything you've won. Maybe so, but I can sell some of them for money, and return the others in exchange for having some powerful people owe me favors. Tamari poked Itachi's head, this probably goes without saying, but I assume you're going to return the man's wife. Kisame looked up from his book. Bah! I bet there are some groups who would pay handsomely to have her as a hostage, use her to blackmail her husband. Tamari crossed her arms, I sometimes can't believe you people. Naruto looked up lazily from where he was lounging, he was joking, Tamari. Do you really think we'd go to all the trouble of trying to transport and sell a person when we could just sell off that summer cottage? Okay, I think you're missing the point, but it really doesn't matter. Naruto was not really listening as his mind had moved on to other more obvious sources of interest, speaking of junk, it looks like you got quite a haul yourself, Kisame. This is not junk. I used to have the greatest known collection of Jaws memorabilia in the world, but I was forced to leave it all behind in hidden mist. You must really like the movie. Kisame adjusted his Jaws hat, it's my favorite. I'm always inspired when I see it to strive for great things, just like the hero in the movie, except that it's so sad when he dies at the end. Tamari huffed, thanks for ruining the ending. Itachi pulled a bobblehead of some famous actor out of his box of stuff and threw it over his shoulder into his trash pile, don't worry, Tamari. Kisame has a rather unique view of Jaws, which I should know since he's dragged me to see it at least seven times. Kisame looked offended, hey, it's a great inspirational movie, and I think every young boy and girl should be taken to see it. A shark, wanting simply to find something to fill his starved belly, and the merciless humans who hunt him. You'll laugh, cry and be moved by the poor shark's struggle to live. Tamari was wide-eyed, oka a a i i i e then. A stuffed monkey flew through the air and landed in the trash pile as Itachi continued to dig through the box, so anyway, enough about us. What have you two been up to all evening? Thinking he sounded a tad smug, Tamari was cautious, not much. Went to a movie and ate some sushi. That's it? Sounds pretty boring, are you sure you're not leaving anything out? Of course. Why are you acting so suspicious? What do you think I'm not telling you? Well, for example, Itachi said matter-of-factly, you're forgetting to mention your makeout session in the forest, if it was even as tame as that. And just so we're clear, Itachi continued in that same tone of voice, you two are free to do whatever you want as long as Kisame and I aren't around, since we really don't want to listen. Tamari glared, I wasn't aware that we needed your permission. Kisame smirked and brushed away an imaginary tear, ah, they grow up so fast, don't they, Itachi? Despite having been just moments ago in a very good mood, Naruto was getting annoyed, do you really want me to kick your ass that badly, Kisame? Ha! Huh. I'd like to see you try, brat. 
Just as the two swordsmen were gearing themselves up, Tamari tossed her sleeping bag over her shoulder and grabbed Naruto's arm, come on, these nutcrackers aren't going to let up any time soon, so we'll sleep somewhere else tonight. Not really caring, Naruto just let himself be led into the woods, though he had the mind to grab his sword and pack on the way. They hadn't been gone a minute when Kisame noticed something amiss and raised his voice to call after them, hey guys, you only have one sleeping bag. Tamari's voice echoed out from the trees with an edge of amusement to it, that's all we'll need. The ex Akatsuki shared a look, and Kisame let out a low whistle, well. She's rather feisty, isn't she? Surprisingly, yes. We were, in a word, owned. I'm not sure it was quite that bad. Itachi gave him a flat look. Well, maybe it was that bad, but we can at least claim a moral victory. No, Kisame, we can't. Our bluff was called, and plans of harassment were foiled. Bah. All they've done is temporarily delayed our mocking, since they have to come back in the morning. Not only that, they've given us a whole night to improve out strategy. True. Itachi was silent for a moment, and if they want to give us extra time, then it would be a waste not to use it. Dash. Naruto examined his position with rapt anticipation. Tamari was vulnerable, she knew it, and yet she would be completely unable to stop him. He moved in for the kill, barely able to retrain himself. Your precious bishop is mine. Check. Bastard. The sleeping bag had been fully unzipped and laid on the ground like a picnic blanket, in the center of which now sat Naruto's chessboard. Are you ready to concede yet? I have checkmate in two moves. I need time to think. That, Naruto said pointedly, was what you said about your last move, and yet after five minutes of thinking you moved exactly where I knew you would and brought me one move closer to checkmate. So now again you are going to think, and four or so minutes from now, you are going to make what we both know is the only move you can and thus I will be one move from checkmate, so you should just give up. Tamari ground her teeth, you should just shut up. Naruto almost started whistling the Jeopardy theme, but figured that might be pushing it, so I take it I'm going to be the one who's sleeping on the ground? Well yeah, what kind of man would you be if you made a girl sleep on cold hard dirt? Naruto rolled his eyes, but refrained from making further snide comments. Time passed slowly, and Tamari slowly had to accept that Naruto had been right. There was only one move she could make, I'm going to get you next time. Naruto laughed, sure you are. Dash. Late that night, when the night was quiet but for the sound of Tamari's breathing, Naruto slowly sat up and crept over to where his sword was laying against a tree. Being as silent as possible, he lifted the weapon and slowly snuck away. He continued moving for quite some time, more concerned about the chakra he would give off than the noise he would make, so he made sure to be at least four miles from any other people. Sitting on the ground, he laid Sere Kirite in front of him and ran his hands over the blade, his mind sinking slowly into itself. You there, stupid fox? About time. I've been waiting for hours. Stop whining, you're getting an amazing opportunity, so you have no right to complain. Conceding the point, Kyuubi controlled his urge to spew insults. Anyway, Naruto said suddenly, what's this jutsu called? What is it with you humans and naming things? This particular technique could never have had a name since you invented it, but you could call it giggity giggity gig no jutsu and it wouldn't make the slightest difference in how it worked. Naruto had never really thought about it, but he supposed the fox had a point. Shrugging to himself, he drew himself fully back into the real world, bit his thumb and streaked a line of blood across the flat of his blade, forming familiar hand seals, but in a new combination giggity giggity gig no jutsu. There was a momentary surge of chakra, a little smoke, and the jutsu was complete. It was with great trepidation that Kyuubi slowly opened his eyes and looked down at his hands, kick ass. In place of Naruto's familiar sword stood a young man, one who was now doing backflips just for the sheer joy of being able. Naruto, on the other hand, felt a strange sense of satisfaction, so how does it feel to have a body again? Well, it is a human body, and so completely inferior to the noble body of a fox, but I suppose I'll manage. For all his haughtiness, the demon was betrayed by the fact that he continuously flexed and stretched his muscles with apparent delight. Now I'm hoping you will remember the time limit. Yeah, yeah, brat. I'll be back tomorrow mid-morning. And remember, Naruto spoke, you may have a body, but the same rules as always apply. If you break even one, I'll know and you may find yourself quickly being cut off from the chakra that keeps you transformed. Yes, father. Speaking of which, how real am I? Technically, the body you're inhabiting is a variation on the hinge, but reinforced with chakra. You are for all intents and purposes human for the next 12 hours, 
but I'd avoid rough physical contact. The demon suddenly dashed off, and Naruto followed closely, having guessed what Kyuubi had in mind. Arriving at a lake, the fox bent over and examined his reflection, hey, I look pretty good. The babes are going to be all over me. Naruto smiled to himself, one more thing, you've helped me out today, and so I'm going to allow a little mayhem, but only a little. Kyuubi suddenly noticed something strange about his clothing, an insignia on the back of his shirt. Wait a second you made me look like Uchiha Sasuke. Naruto started to make his way back toward the campsite, yes, yes I did. Dash. Both Naruto and Tamari slept in, relatively, late the next morning, so Sere Kirite was back next to Naruto, the sword showing no sigh that just hours ago it had been romping around River City in the form of Uchiha Sasuke. Though unbeknownst to the Uchiha himself, all the city guard had been given Sasuke's, Kyuubi's, picture and were told to bring him to the central tower if ever spotted, to be charged with mischief and public disturbance. It would be a shame that some years down the road when Uchiha Sasuke actually did visit River City, Naruto was not in the nearby area to see the chaos that followed, but that is another story entirely. Tamari and Naruto of them stumbled back into the main camp only to notice a distinct lack of Itachi and Kisame. There was, however, a pile of a few scrolls and a Polaroid photo, which Tamari picked up and examined. It was a picture of Itachi and Kisame wearing cloaks, but they weren't their old Akatsuki ones, although the pattern did look familiar. There was a written caption that said since he won't be needing it anymore and it clicked. Oi! Naruto, get over here. You won't believe what those two whack jobs did with your sleeping bag. Naruto had one of the previously piled scrolls in his hand and was reading the first few lines, considering what I've got here, I would believe anything. It appears that your sleeping bag has been made into clothing, though how the two of them managed to pull it off in one night is beyond me. Well, Naruto said, count me as even more amazed because this scroll is, and I quote, the Uchiha and Hoshigaki complete annotated encyclopedia of everything two hormonally charged teenagers might do while alone in the forest with just a large sword and Naruto's pack. Creepy. What's really creepy is that they knew exactly what was in my pack. And I mean exactly, down to every last used gum wrapper. Tamari grabbed one of the other scrolls, apparently one wasn't enough, because here's Twa COFK'd Wait for Jalzamp Volume 2, and I'd bet that's Volume 3 on the ground there. They managed to fill three scrolls? They must be a lot more creative than we are, since all we really did was play chess and sleep. So they managed to sew two cloaks from a sleeping bag and come up with and write three scrolls worth of ideas which I suspect are mostly sick, twisted, or both, all in one night? Naruto took a look at the photo. No one takes stupid jokes more seriously than Kisame and Itachi. They're probably not here because they wanted to get some sleep somewhere we wouldn't find them. Tamari crushed the Polaroid in her hand, well, I'm going to find them, and they'll be damn sorry when I do. She paced back and forth fuming while Naruto read the first scroll with no small amount of amusement, well, you have to at least give them credit for sheer effort. The boy tilted his head to the side as a kunai whizzed by his ear, okay, so maybe you don't. Dash. Tamari never did find where Itachi and Kisame were sleeping, but the two ex Akatsuki strolled into camp that evening with wads of cash, announcing they had sold a little of Itachi's acquired capital and returned the rest. Having spent the day wandering around with Naruto as he bought a new sleeping bag, the sand girl had almost completely cooled down, and had even allowed herself to read a few entries of Twa COFK'd Wait for Jalzamp, which she would never admit, were at least a little bit funny. Dash. Early Mate morning. Itachi withdrew the business card Mako had given him a few days earlier, so, what are people's views on going to see this Vincent person? Tamari leaned against a tree, I think we should go for it, I figure there's no harm in asking for payment when the job is already done. So then, Kisame interjected, what do we do if he refuses? Are we ready to threaten him, and if so, are we willing to go through with any threat we might make? Itachi looked at Naruto, you did the job, so it's your call. He tapped the hilt of his sword rhythmically. I agree that we have very little to lose by trying, assuming we're discreet, and a few subtle threats might be required. On the other hand, I want to avoid violence, so if push comes to shove, we back off. Sound good? Getting a generally affirmative response, Naruto nodded to himself, but then comes the problem of who should go. Kisame grinned, all of us. Are you sane? Itachi said bluntly, suggesting that you, a registered missing nin of this country, could walk into the central tower of this city unchallenged. Yes, I am. On what basis? You'll all just have to find out. Tamari poked at the coals of the fire, making sure they were all out, you're not messing with us, right? 
we're not going to walk up to the central tower only to be surrounded by members of the city guard? Well, subtlety will be required, but once we're in the tower, there won't be a problem. However, this doesn't mean we won't need to prepare a little bit. Itachi joined the Akatsuki almost immediately after leaving his village, and so has never really dealt with clients personally, meaning I have to explain to you people how to prepare for and handle a meeting with a poobah. Naruto harumphed, and what makes you an authority? Kisame looked annoyed, all right, everyone take a shot at guessing how old I am. Itachi looked his longtime partner over carefully, curious as he suddenly realized he didn't know the shark man's age 26. Tamari shrugged unknowingly, um, 23. Naruto continued to tap his sword hilt, I'll go with Itachi on this one, 26. Kisame stared at them blankly for a couple seconds, then started to laugh, I'm glad I look so youthful, but I'm afraid to say I've been walking this earth for a full 30 years. Itachi's mouth would have hung open had he allowed himself such displays of emotion, and Naruto's mouth was hanging open. Tamari seemed the only one to be impressed rather than astonished. So, as I'm 11 years older than even Itachi, making my time as a shinobi almost twice his, I've had much more variety in my experiences. One of those experiences is that I have, on many occasions, met with high and done jobs for high officials. Any more arguments? No? Good. With a few quick hand seals Kisame and Naruto concealed their more bizarre features, and thus the four set off for the city. None were concerned about carrying large weapons, as in this city, they blended in perfectly. To Tamari's delight, the place Kisame led them to was a shopping mall. All right, Kisame said authoritatively, we are not going to visit the Puba as Nuknan, but as contractors and business people, meaning we need to dress sharply. Does anyone have any ideas or... Suddenly a dark suspicion popped into Kisame's head as he recalled that he had never seen Itachi wear anything other than a black shirt and black pants, whereas Naruto wore only a navy vest and black pants. We might have a problem here. Dash. Kabuto and Sasuke arrived at their Mark's estate and almost immediately realized why the Akatsuki had been the ones to take this mission. Not only was the estate crawling with guards, there were dogs everywhere. Sasuke observed their motions and immediately guessed the dog's purpose, they're sniffing the guards to make sure no one is an imposter using henge. Kabuto shook his head, those dogs can't have been easy to train, that kind of expense paid suggests our mark is expecting assassins. Activating his Sharingan, Sasuke almost fell out of the tree, shit. There must be 20, 30, 40, more than 40 genjutsu traps. We step on the wrong blade of grass and alarms are going to go off while we try to get out of whatever genjutsu it is, he released his Sharingan and rubbed his head, there's so much it's disrupting my vision. So we're rethinking the chop the guard on the neck and take his place approach? Rethinking? We're trashing it. This mission is going to require much more deviousness, which is probably why they gave it to my brother. And of course, now you're going to give it your all just to prove you can do anything Itachi can. Sasuke smirked, damn straight. Dash. It had been a unanimous decision among those whose votes counted, Kisame and Tamari, to go with suit since kimonos made Itachi look too feminine and made Naruto and Kisame just look weird. For the sake of consistency, Tamari was told she would have to dress likewise, but she secretly preferred western suits to kimonos as well. Itachi and Naruto appeared perplexed by the black suits they were given and eventually came out and asked where the shuriken holsters were. This was followed by a long involved description of exactly what a suit was, how to wear it, and why it didn't have shuriken holsters. Tamari then dragged Naruto off to get his haircut while Kisame shopped for sunglasses and every female within sight range swamped Itachi. Arriving back 15 minutes later feeling refreshed, Naruto discovered Itachi reaching his breaking point as girls of every age surrounded him to stare and or drool and or grope. Suspecting that any moment now Itachi would grab a kunai and get stabby, Naruto made urgent gestures suggesting that Itachi make a quick escape to the men's washroom located only 50 or so feet away. A couple minutes later, Kisame emerged triumphantly holding a number of small boxes, Yo Naruto! What happened to Itachi? Even as he spoke, Itachi burst from the washroom like a bat out of hell and made it to the protection of where Kisame and Naruto stood in less than three seconds. As soon as he appeared, the girls started to gather, but were held back by the rather imposing men with large swords. Figuring Tamari might be a while shopping for herself, Kisame and Naruto escorted Itachi back the store to change back into his regular clothes, after which the three of them wandered aimlessly around the mall. Eventually, Naruto got bored enough to start wondering that if one swallowed a kunai, would one die from suffocation or blood loss first? He figured suffocation, and was just starting to consider testing this theory out when Tamari appeared carrying various bags and appearing absolutely ecstatic. 
Naruto glared, nice of you to hurry, since we weren't waiting or anything. Oh, shut up. I'm in far too good a mood to be annoyed by you. So then can we at least go now? We've been here for over three hours. Yes, we can, though I may go back and look more if you keep whining. Suddenly noticing that Naruto, Kisame and Itachi were already walking away, Tamari trailed off and rushed to follow. Later that day. As the four made final preparations, Kisame sat with Tamari watching as the other two struggled to move in foreign garments, it's not fair, is it? No, she agreed, it's not. I mean, between the two of them they don't have as much fashion sense as a bowl of cottage cheese, but once they actually get dressed up. Tamari sighed, Naruto looks amazing, and Itachi could pass as a friggin' model. Makes me want to go become a nudist, everyone is equal that way. This comment immediately caused all movement within 30 feet to cease. Birds stopped chirping, bees stopped buzzing, and the wind stopped blowing. After a moment of realizing everything had gone quiet, Kisame looked around blankly, I was being sarcastic, you know. Unfortunately, the damage had been done as each person tried vainly to rid themselves of the mental image. Tamari shook her head violently, let us never speak of this again. Kisame coughed, well fine then, I was just making a joke. Itachi was rubbing his temples as if plagued by a headache, next time, please make your jokes out of earshot. Some people have no sense of humor. Naruto snorted with amused derision, some people have no sense of decency. Well some people are just stupid. Hey, I don't need to take that from a guy who looks like he belongs in an aquarium. Ha! Huh. This coming from someone most suited for a zoo cage? As the two started into what Tamari suspected would be a rather long exchange of insults, she gathered up her own purchases and made her way to one of the many nearby lakes. Never having been one to care much about fashion, she was nonetheless overjoyed at the thought of now having something other than her shinobi uniform. She dressed quickly so as not to make the others wait, but fortunately for Tamari, she had underestimated how long Kisame and Naruto could maintain a stupid argument, for not only were they were still at it when she finally made it back, they appeared to be nearing the point at which swords would be picked up and landscapes devastated. Figuring the two of them should have gotten it out of their systems by now and were probably just angling for an excuse to pick up the aforementioned sword so they could devastate the aforementioned landscapes, she intervened all right, quit it. Kisame, weren't you just telling us a few hours ago how experienced you are? Shouldn't you then also then have an equal amount of maturity to go with your experience? Kisame rolled the thought around in his head for a few seconds, hmm, well, yes, I should but that doesn't mean I do. PFFT, and you're supposed to be our role model? Kisame turned to deliver a witty retort but stopped when he saw her, well now, said in wonderment, and all this time I just assumed your hair was stuck in those four spiky ponytail things. Tamari flushed, don't be stupid. I just do it that way so my hair never bothers me. Kisame pouted slightly at being rebuked, but suddenly brightened again, hey, we have to do our thing. Nothing happened for a moment, then, as if cued by some silent maestro, the three reached into their breast pockets, pulled out sunglasses, snapped them open with a flick of the wrist and slid them smoothly on all in perfect synchronization. Tamari burst out laughing. Kisame stood thunderstruck, then he and Naruto both cursed and passed some money to Itachi, which the Uchiha collected smugly. It took a couple of minutes for Tamari to calm down, during which time she almost tripped from laughing so hard. As she eventually gathered control of herself, she noticed Naruto's irate state, sorry about that, but you guys look like a bunch of dysfunctional yakuza. It's not personal Naruto grumbled, we all made a bet on how you would respond. Kisame figured you'd think it was cool, I figured you'd roll your eyes and brush us off, and Itachi said you'd laugh. The two losers had to pay the winner 5,000 yen each. So now that you three are done being silly, can we get on to the important stuff? With a forlorn sigh for his 5,000 yen, Kisame nodded, all right then, a couple things that the more unstable of us have to remember. It's true that we could crush the entire city guard without much effort, that doesn't however mean that we treat the Puba with anything less than the greatest respect. Speak only when spoken to or when I signal you. Most important, no matter what I do, make no threatening gestures of any kind. He turned to Itachi, so no sharing anning and no weapons, then to Naruto, and since you have built-in weapons, you must do your very best to look meek. No bearing of fangs or flexing of claws. Despite mild annoyance, there were sounds of grudging agreement on all sides, and Kisame gathered his thoughts, it's getting later in the day, so we need to leave now and keep a low profile. A reputation is a freelance Nuknin's most valuable asset, and we have the perfect chance here to start a good rep, so no mistakes on this. Dash. 
Sasuke and Kabuto stared at a rough sketch of their Marxist state and the guard movements they had observed. So, Sasuke-sama, any new ideas? Is there any kind of genjutsu we could use that we could use on the guards that we could later lift without anyone noticing? Well, yes, but we need the whole household to be under its influence, and we don't know how many are inside. Not only that, but we're not sure how a genjutsu placed over an area that's saturated with genjutsu traps might be altered. Can we even be sure that the mark is in the house? That will require some reconnaissance. So assuming everything goes according to what we have as far as a plan goes, what's our time frame? Kabuto scratched his head, I'd guess about three to four days. Sasuke started to absentmindedly nibble his thumbnail, crap, we need to move faster, I have an idea for a genjutsu that might work, but it will need to be refined. Can you be reasonably sure of the presence of both the mark and his wife given a whole day to observe? Sure enough, Sasuke-sama. All right then, keep your sleeping time tonight short and start observing. I'll have my genjutsu ready in 18 hours, but then I'll need to sleep for 8. That will mean that if we give ourselves 4 hours to prep and plan, we can start the operation in exactly 30 hours. Determined to get this over with quickly? Wouldn't a bit more patience be prudent? Sasuke nodded, maybe, but how long would this mission have taken Kisame and Itachi? Forget sleep, I'll start observations now. Dash. Vincent was not what one would call a fat man, but nor was he thin. The best way the Pooba had ever come up with to describe his physique was that he fit his chair perfectly. This was extremely fortunate, for he spent most of every day in his chair, seated behind a large oak desk. On the other side of the desk were eight other chairs arranged in a semicircle, where his numerous visitors sat. He had entertained people of every variety in the course of his term, but as he sat reading through reports describing modifications to the city's sewer system, he was completely unaware of the visitors he was about to receive. He heard a knock at his door, come. His secretary pushed the door open nervously, Karen says there are, people, here to see you. Karen was the lady who worked at the desk downstairs, and Vincent knew that whenever she used the intercom to inform his secretary of visitors, she always gave a detailed description, and what did she say about them? There are four of them, but she seems mostly concerned with a large man who she says looks like he's going to eat her. They certainly sound, colorful. Are they armed? No sir. Vincent momentarily considered sending them away, but his gut told him not to. And besides, his report was about as mentally stimulating as watching ice melt, tell Karen to send them up. Setting his papers to one side, he reached into one of his desk drawers and pulled out a clay jar and spoon. Dipping the spoon in, he withdrew a dollop of golden syrup and slid it into his mouth with a warm sigh. Cleaning the spoon as best he could with his mouth, he replaced the clay pot and spoon back into their drawer, feeling much refreshed. He heard a knock on his door, enter. His door was almost thrown open, and Vincent's eyes tightened at the first figure that pushed confidently into his office, well, Hoshigaki Kisame, what a pleasant and rather interesting surprise. Naruto was thrown off kilter by the Puba's apparent lack of shock at having an S-class missing nin walk into his office, but noticed there was a subtle tension in the air. Kisame took a step forward, nice to see you too, sir. Vincent leaned back in his chair, somehow I knew you'd show up here someday. But I forget my manners, he turned to address the group as a whole, my name is Vincent Marmite III, Puba of River City and the surrounding area. I am well acquainted with Hoshigaki, but I fear I am unfamiliar with the rest of you. Naruto, Tamari and Itachi took turns introducing themselves as politely as possible while the Puba examined them each with an unreadable expression. When they were done, he rested his elbows on his desk and laced his hands together, the suspicion that this might be a trap has I'm sure passed through all your minds by now, so I would like to clarify exactly how I am acquainted with Hoshigaki-san. In actual fact, not one of them had suspected a trap, because Itachi trusted Kisame completely and Naruto trusted Kisame completely. Tamari placed her trust in Naruto, who trusted Kisame, thus, she trusted the shark man as well. Despite all this, they were all curious, so none corrected the Puba. It really was, Vincent said reflectively, a minor event that had a huge impact. Back then I was a protester, nothing more than a punk, really, but I had a cause. The previous Puba was a true incompetent, but was the brother of a crime boss, and so remained in power for two full terms. He was about to be elected for a third time, and I started a number of major protests and one or two riots to try and stop him. Naruto tried to imagine the man in front of him as a upstart idealist punk, and found he couldn't as the man continued, I was at almost given up hope, but one night I found a note pinned to my door. It wasn't signed, 
but offered to solve my problems if I could provide safe passage to the mainland for one person and would agree to keep silent. I posted a reply note agreeing, went to bed, and woke the next day to the news that Hoshigaki Kisame, the daimyo killer, had broken into the city that night had had killed the Puba. The next day I smuggled Kisame San out of water country, and I haven't heard anything of him until today. How many years ago was that? Kisame asked rhetorically, I can't even remember for sure, but I was much younger. As was I, Vincent said with a shade of nostalgia, but I doubt you are here to reminisce. Kisame subtly poked Naruto in the shoulder and the boy took the hint, we are here with regards to the incident concerning the bandit camp recently destroyed. Vincent laughed and waved for Naruto to stop, of course, of course. Had I known Kisame was in the area, there would have been no doubt in my mind as to how the camp was destroyed. You shall be paid in full. Kisame looked sheepish, actually, it was Naruto who destroyed the camp, and he did so by himself, so the money goes to him. Raising his eyebrows, Vincent re-examined the boy, you don't say, in that case, the reward is 400,000 yen, the same as I would have paid Hidden Mist. Naruto almost fell over, 400,000 yen? Are you sure? Of course, young man. I pay based on the job, not who does it. You did a B-rank mission, so you get the money for such. Well, thank you very much, sir. In a much better mood than he had been in for quite some time, the Puba grabbed up his clay pot again and ate a spoonful of the tasty contents, causing Naruto to lean forward, is that honey? Why yes, it is, and now that our business is concluded, I fear I must reintroduce myself, because although I am technically Vincent Marmite blah blah blah, my friends, and I hope I can count Kisame's friends as my friends, call me Vinny, he slurped down another spoonful of honey with a grin, Vinny the Pooh, Chapter 29, Sark Stings and Kabuto Sings. Naruto licked the palm of his hand and sucked each finger, man, that honey really is good. See? Vincent said confidently, everyone makes fun of my honey eating, that is until they try it. I mean seriously, you people need to try this. No, Tamari said bluntly, I'm quite sure we don't. Bah! Suit yourself. Oh, I almost forgot, Kisame Vincent said as Naruto dug into his clay pot in search of honey, Sark was here with his daughter recently and though it's a big city, you should watch yourself. Kisame blinked, wait. Sark is here, as in, Sark of the Hidden Mist? As in, Sark, Swordmaster of the Hidden Mist? Hmm? Yeah. Like I said, you probably don't need to worry. He wanted a list of all the high-powered shinobi in the area, then he and his daughter left. Hold on a second, Kisame said nervously, just being within 30 square miles of Sark would make me worry, so being in the same city as him is a big deal. Naruto spoke through a mouthful of honey, how come Yesh care so much anyway? Allow me to be blunt, I learned swordsmanship from Hitro Matsu, who learned swordsmanship from Ganju Sakai, and he learned swordsmanship from Ikana Sark. Are we now getting some idea of why I'm concerned? Itachi crossed his arms, but it's not like he's one of the seven swordsmen or anything, so I think you're overreacting. Kisame shook his head, Sark was around before the seven swordsmen, and his daughter, Ikana Seraphim, is one of the seven swordsmen. Not only that, as if he weren't enough of a pain on his own, Sark uses a powerful ninjutsu sword and no one has any idea where he got it. Well, Tamari said, now I'm worried. Naruto was silent as his thoughts churned, Tamari. I think we saw him. What? That old guy, at the restaurant. I think, no, I'm sure that was him. It would be far too much of a coincidence for there to be two old men in this city able to hide their chakra that well, and yet still have so much of it. Kisame started to pace, well this is just great. We are so screwed. I'm amazed we haven't been found out already, especially considering the first place they'd look for people like us would. Struck by momentary insight, his eyes riveted themselves to the office door, which slowly started to open. Dash. For if I were an Oscar Mayer Wefivener, everyone would be in love with me. Kabuto sat in tree, singing to himself. It wasn't like there was anyone close enough to hear him and watching guards wander around can only amuse someone for so long. Dash. Vincent's secretary pushed her head into the office door, excuse me sir, but Sark Sama is here to see you again. The young secretary balked at having so many piercing gazes focused on her, even as the Puba muttered to himself then spoke firmly, tell him I'm busy. If that doesn't work, have the building's power cut. The secretary rushed back out, sensing urgency, yes sir. Kisame smacked his fist into the palm of his other hand, we have maybe three minutes, so everyone listen carefully. Seraphim will most definitely be waiting on the ground just outside the window, and we have no weapons. 
Itachi appeared unconcerned, ah, and whose fault is that? This is not the time to be smug, Itachi. I have to think. And so, with a very determined, but still very polite, old man pushing his way past Karen the door lady downstairs, there was silence in the Puba's office as Kisame applied his often underestimated intelligence to getting them out of there. The proverbial light bulb appeared at last, got it. Dash. Ikana Seraphim stood below the central tower impatiently, leaning her rather small sword against her shoulder. It is worth noting that the term rather small sword is used relatively, meaning that she used a katana rather than some type of broadsword and it was only five or so feet long. Her father had told her to just stand and watch the Puba's office window. That was it, stand and watch a window. She had trained her whole life, practiced until she fainted from chakra depletion, and finally achieved membership as the first woman in the Seven Swordsmen. And her father told her to stand and watch a window. It wasn't even a very interesting window, just a big sheet of glass somehow adhered to the wall. That was, until it shattered. Shards of glass rained into the street as hundreds of clones poured out the window, running and leaping off in all directions. Her eyes scanned the mass, the surrounding buildings making it impossible to use the mass-destructive type of jutsu typically used to clear such numbers of clones. She was just about to send her own clone army in pursuit, when she noticed a chakra fluctuation. Locking her senses onto that clone, she bounded after it. Among the clones, Naruto and Tamari, who looked like Naruto thanks to a henge, ran quickly while not allowing themselves to move faster than the general mass of clones. Naruto glanced back, I think she took the bait, since she's coming after us. Can I just say now that I think this plan is completely insane? Sure, if it will make you feel better, but I suggest we run faster, since she's catching up. And was it really necessary to waste chakra on all those clones? Yes, because otherwise it would have been too obvious that we were drawing her away. They hit the city limits and started leaping through trees rather than buildings. But still, that may have been a bit excessive. Naruto silently conceded, but it was more because he wanted to focus on running than because he agreed with her. They neared their destination and Tamari fell back slightly, allowing Naruto to pull in front of her. Dash. Itachi and Kisame stood in the street, watching as the main door to the central tower was pushed open and an old man walked towards them, leaning on his staff for support, how nice to see you again, Kisame-san. I have to say I wasn't expecting you. Kisame scratched the back of his head, of the two of us, Sarksama, I can assure you I'm the more surprised. You appear to be unarmed today. But I'm more interested in how those friends of yours managed to get my daughter away from here. Simple. I relied on the fact that you hadn't told her anything about the person or people you were after, so there was no way for her to know that there were four of us. Ah, so you remembered how much I enjoy being cryptic, do you? I will never forget. You were the one who first told me that a mission is no fun when you know what's going to happen. That may be true, but a mission is also no fun when the enemy is unarmed, so I suggest you remedy that problem quickly. Oh, don't worry. Dash. A certain white-haired medic nin's hands were tapping his tree rhythmically. When the chimes ring five, six and seven, we'll be right in seventh heaven. We're gonna rock. Around. The clock tonight, we're gonna rock, 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 till broad daylight. We're gonna rock, gonna rock, around the clock tonight. Dash. Blasting into the campsite, Naruto grabbed Seimata and jumped as high as he could. A nanosecond later, Tamari had her fan and through no small feat of acrobatics, opened it and sent a shockwave of air straight up, launching Naruto high above the trees. Holding Seimata by the hilt, like a javelin, Naruto forced as much chakra as he could into his arm, causing a few veins to pop out and a small spurt of blood, and threw the sharkskin blade as hard as he could. Seraphim looked up as the sword flew over her head at near supersonic speeds, Seimata. She twisted in mid-air, hitting the next branch backwards and launching herself back the way she had come. Dash. Sark was continuing to smile politely, so, Kisame, did you ever manage to get the feel for that backhand twist cut? Nah, could never get the timing quite perfect, so I figured out a way to compensate by speeding up my backhand cross cut. Not as graceful, but equally effective. Itachi slowly shifted his gaze between the two swordsmen, finally settling on Sark, so. I hear you saw Naruto at a restaurant. Naruto? So that's his name. Well then, give him my compliments if you see him, because his sensory attunement is truly amazing. I'm sure he'll appreciate praise from one such as yourself. Whoa, Kisame cut in, here it comes. Running over to a wall and running up it, Kisame back flipped off and grabbed Seimata as it flew past, landing lightly in a crouch, 
Sorry for the delay. I'm ready now. Sark grabbed his wooden staff by its thick end, his hand facing the ground, and flipped the staff so he was holding it like a sword, excellent. I was getting impatient. Itachi blinked, um. Am I fighting too? Of course, Sark said as if it were obvious, Kisame alone won't keep me entertained for very long. As he spoke, a ripple rolled down his staff, the wood seeming to melt into the shape of a blade. Wait a second, you're going to fight Kisame and me with a wooden sword? Kisame sweat dropped, Itachi. Why yes, I am. Do you have a problem with that? Not really, but. The Uchiha blinked, Sark was gone. He threw himself to one side out of pure instinct, and the earth exploded behind him. When he looked again, Sark's wooden sword was embedded halfway into where he had been standing, and the old man himself was balanced on top, my my, and I'd heard that the Uchiha had the best eyes anywhere. Do try to keep up with me next time. There was a blur of movement and Itachi again got himself out of the way with fractions of a second to spare. Dash. Tamari looked around nervously as they ran through the forest away from the city, now rearmed and resupplied, are you sure it's okay to leave them like that? Naruto shrugged, well, Kisame said we'd just get in the way, and considering the opponent, I'm inclined to believe him. She looked at him skeptically, but. There is the small matter of the fact that I'd rather not have to fight a sword master of hidden mist, but Kisame said they'd be fine, and we have to trust him on that. Dash. And I'm, too sexy for the leaf. Too sexy for the leaf, I like pot stewed beef. Kabuto was now at the point of making up his own lyrics, and realized with a start that he was rather hungry. Chapter 30, Dark Waters. Itachi examined their current situation grimly, brilliant plan you came up with Kisame. With only seconds having passed, Itachi counted no less than three cuts of varying depth on his own body, and approximately the same had been inflicted on Kisame. It was a position the two were not used to being in. Sark didn't seem to have a particularly enormous amount of chakra, but his skills and style were on a whole different level than anything the two Nuknin had ever faced. The old man stood there so innocuously, daring one of them to attack him. The Uchiha was quickly realizing the benefits of wooden swords, the primary being their lack of weight. Despite his skill, Itachi had no doubt that but for his Sharingan, he would have been dead after the first strike. Sark was at least as fast as him, and far faster than Kisame, but he lacked the ability to block the man's surprisingly deadly wooden sword, which Kisame could by way of Seimata. So in summary, Itachi concluded, Sark possessed a level of skill approximately equal to that of Kisame and himself combined. As if suddenly bored by the lack of action, Sark suddenly vanished again, but this time Itachi was prepared. His eyes could just barely keep up with the old man, so he had to dodge again, but he twisted and dove right, so if Sark wanted to close for a second strike, he would have to pincer himself between Itachi and Kisame. Not appearing overly concerned, the old man did just that. The Uchiha tried to dodge again, but felt a telltale burn in his leg where the wooden blade cut into his muscle. Shifting his weight to his other foot, Itachi tried to counter-attack just as Kisame took advantage of the opening Sark's back left him. Still wearing that infernal smile, Sark grabbed Itachi's wrist and flung him over Kisame's head while bringing his sword round to parry Seimata, catching the shark man off balance and sending him following Itachi's trajectory with a well-placed kick. And I had such high expectations for the two of you. Now I'm all disappointed. Itachi pushed Kisame off him and dragged himself up, well, apparently this will require more planning than usual. Kisame shook his head to clear it, no shit. I don't suppose you have any brilliant ideas? The Uchiha didn't at first, but taking a slow step forward he heard a crunch under his foot, I might just have a couple. Do you remember what I once called the most useless skill ever? Flashback. Kisame took his sword and swung it into a tree, barely even scratching the bark, but suddenly all the leaves fell off it and slowly floated to the ground. Itachi looked at him dully, so you can create vibrations, who cares? That's the most useless skill I've ever seen. And flashback. Yeah. Well, I want you to do it now. That building behind us first and then the street. I have no idea what you're thinking, but it has to be better than what we've been doing so far. Taking a couple cautious steps backwards, his eyes still on Sark, Kisame suddenly slammed Seimata into the wall behind him. The shockwave was visible as the whole building shook and the windows shattered in rapid succession starting with those nearest to Kisame. The cloud of broken glass fell towards the earth and Itachi dashed forward. Sark watched the Uchiha's movements curiously, but just as he was running to intercept, he felt a small scratch on his face and stopped cold, figuring out the trick, clever, Uchiha. Very clever. Glass continued to fall, 
and Kisame smashed his sword into the ground, sending a shockwave through the earth this time, the vibrations launching what glass had already hit the ground back into the air. He repeated this every few seconds, keeping the air filled with glass. Sark let the shards fall over him as he contemplated. The falling glass meant that both he and Itachi would be severely restricted in their motions, because the faster they moved, the more damage they would receive from the glass. Standing still, it was just like having small pebbles and rocks dropped on you, but at high speeds, the tiny chunks of glass would cut as well as any kunai. Still advancing, Itachi grabbed a couple of the larger pieces and threw them like shuriken, forcing Sark to dodge as fast as he dared. As he felt the sting of another cut on his face, the old man was finally starting to enjoy himself, interesting strategy, but all you've done is slow me down. How do you plan on overpowering me? Grabbing more of the larger shards, Itachi closed the distance between them. To an outsider, the exchange of blows that followed would be almost comical, as both combatants moved and attacked exaggeratedly slowly, for fear of crippling themselves. Hissing as he received a gash on his hand, Sark backpedaled quickly. Both he and Itachi were covered in a great many small cuts, but the swordmaster figured he was faring slightly better. About to advance for another skirmish, Sark suddenly looked up for a moment then glanced at Kisame before refocusing on his opponent, I'm afraid I must cut our game short, fun as it was turning out to be. Itachi, looking far more haggard than usual, laughed darkly, and how do you plan on cutting it short, you're in almost as bad shape as me, old man. With a sigh, Sark closed his eyes and simply felt the glass as it fell and the vibrations under his feet as the echoed through the earth, your name is Itachi, right? Let me say then, Itachi, that I would most definitely like to fight you again someday. Opening his eyes once more, Sark threw his sword away to one side of the street. Ignoring the looks of disbelief he was receiving, he smiled disarmingly, but today you shall learn that talent is no substitute for experience. He formed a single seal then thrust his right arm into the air, Leviathan. Dash. As his mind slowly emerged from its confusion, the first thing he felt was pain. A rather lot of pain. Kisame forced his eyes open, what the hell? His sight was blurry, but he managed to focus when a long-forgotten face appeared in his field of vision, Seraphim? Why are you here? You should be in the forest somewhere, chasing Naruto and Tamari. Well for one, I'm keeping a useless chunk of flesh named Kisame alive. Where's Itachi? I remember using vibration transfer, but my memory starts to blur. And why am I all wet? Reaching down, she grabbed him by the collar and dragged him into a sitting position. Kisame blinked a couple of times as he tried to take everything in. He was still in the street, which was now filled with workers and covered in six inches of water and glass. Itachi was laying face down a few feet away, his back covered in bandages. How long was I out? Seraphim dropped down next to him, thirty or so minutes. And where then exactly is your father? Not sure, but he left right before I arrived, cause the two of you had just begun to bleed. You know, it's strange, because based on how much my side is killing me one would think I should at least remember being injured. He used it, so your brain probably wasn't able to keep up with what was happening right before you were hit, thus causing mild memory loss. Kisame laughed, coughing up some blood in the process, so that was it? This is just perfect. I was witness to one of the greatest legends in mist history and can't remember a damn thing. You should just be thankful you're still breathing. Yeah, about that, why am I alive? I have a hard time believing you bandaged me and Itachi out of pity. Ha! Huh. Fuck no. I would have skewered you, but my father likes strong people, and probably wouldn't like my killing someone he went out of his way to leave alive. Kisame lay back down slowly and grinned, nice to see that you're as charming as always ever, Seraph. You think flattery will get you anywhere? Not really, but hey, why not give it a shot? I don't suppose you have any idea where my dad might have gone? Hmm. Nope. The woman leaned forward and rested her head on her knees, since he went out of his way to leave right before I arrived, I can assume he's going to do something that I wouldn't approve of. Yeah, but there are so many things that fall into that category. How is it possible that you've managed to become more immature with the passage of time? Pure talent, babe. A sound was made a few feet away as Itachi shifted and rolled over, wincing as his back hit ground, what the hell? Dash. Naruto and Tamari ran across the water, both soaked from falling in a few times each. Okay, whose idea was it to run across the ocean? Tamari smacked him, causing him to fall in again, it was your idea. Naruto dragged himself out of the water, running up one side of a wave and down the other, we need to get to the mainland tonight. Waiting for a ferry wasn't an option. 
but running on water doesn't allow for any rest, a stressful enough situation not even considering that at any given time we don't know how much longer we'll have to go. No other options were open to us. Kisame told us to get to the mainland tonight, and I intend to do that no matter what. Flashback. Kisame took Naruto off to a corner of the Puba's office speaking quietly and quickly, now listen here, Sark is way out of your league, and way out of my league, but Itachi and I together have a chance. The most you and Tamari can do for us is to lead Seraphim as far away as possible, because if she joins her father we stand no chance at all. No matter whether we win or lose this fight, the mist will be after you in full force, so escape to the mainland tonight and keep a low profile for a little while. Naruto balked, but that would be abandoning you. I told you, Sark could crush you without a second thought, and I have another task for you. He pressed a piece of paper into Naruto's hand, three months from now, go to this location, it's where my brother is hiding out. If all goes well, Itachi and I will be waiting for you there. If not, I want you to tell Kirin that I went down fighting and wouldn't have had it any other way. The implication shook Naruto to his bones, I. Kisame ignored him and calmly walked back to where the others were hurriedly discussing strategy, don't think about it, Naruto, just do it. And flashback. A cold wind blew across Naruto's face as he ran across the water, I will not fail. Dash. On the shore far behind them, Sark sat on a cliff. He supposed that he could have gone after them across the sea, but he was really in no particular rush. Besides, it had been years since he had indulged in a good chase. He momentarily considered the position his daughter was now in, but dismissed this concern as well. After all, he mused, the experience would build character. Minus 13 days later. Hidden sand was not anything resembling a thriving metropolis, yet even on the hottest of days, a few people would always be active. Gara was one of those people. Not so much because he enjoyed the heat, as because he enjoyed the fact that no one else enjoyed the heat, allowing him to wander the near-empty streets. But the sand boy was troubled on this particular day, and even more troubled because he wasn't exactly sure what was troubling him. He knew there was nothing at all logical about this feeling, but he couldn't help it. He continued to wander, finding himself at the east edge of the village, looking out over the desert. It was the wind, he decided. There was only a warm breeze, but it sent foreboding shivers down his spine. Something. He said quietly, as if afraid he might be hurt, something is going to happen soon. Dash. Many miles farther to the east than Gara's gaze could reach, just outside a small town whose name was not even known by the sand boy, two people lay huddled in a sleeping bag. They had done nothing but run, eat and sleep since that fateful day in the country of water. Naruto wasn't sure what it was that was driving him to keep such a brutal pace, but he felt the need to run in his bones. He shifted and poked Tamari, waking her. Time to go. Tamari yawned, how long did we sleep? Three hours. That's not enough. It will have to be, since we need to leave. They slept mostly clothed, so once awake, it took the two of them only three minutes to be ready to leave. Naruto flexed his leg muscles to loosen them, ready? Yeah. Sleep deprived and with their muscles burning, they set off again, determined to reach the relative safety of hidden sand. Dash. As twilight fell, Sark ran his hands over the ground on which Kubikiri Haucho had been laid only a few hours earlier. Ooh. Lucky. I might catch up tomorrow. Lifting his gaze, he watched the almost unheard of sight of dark clouds gathering in the desert sky and he spoke to the air, getting impatient are we? A flash of lighting lacerated its way to earth, and in the empty desert, the old man's eyes reflected a deep blue light, I know. And to tell the truth. I'm exited as well. The last vestiges of sunlight vanished, immersing the world in darkness. Dash. Sakura navigated her way through piles of bound books, scrolls, and various other knickknacks, excuse me, Hanzo-sama. The Hokage sent me to get your report. Hanzo emerged from what had moments earlier appeared to be a solid wall of literature. Sakura swore his house must employ some sort of genjutsu, since he was the only one who could figure out how to get anywhere. He looked elated, I may have found it, Sakura-san. Found what? I've been refreshing my knowledge of ancient languages, and might have found a clue to the identity of the demon who subdued the village. He held a scroll out for her to see, which meant absolutely nothing to her, I'm sorry, but I don't. Oh, wrong scroll, how silly of me to forget, Hanzo said excitedly, see, this scroll contains information written by a group of people who used to worship demons. Sakura blanched, worship demons? Yes, and it's not so crazy when you think about it. They serve the demons in return for protection and power, 
and this symbiotic relationship continued for hundreds of years, until a young chief scorned the demon race and the people were wiped out. Now this is mostly irrelevant, but these people kept the best known records of the different demons, along with information about them. Then why didn't you check their records before? Oh, the demon religion existed long after our assailant disappeared from history, but I hoped to find some clues in their records and I did. Digging through the pockets of his robes, Hanzo pulled out a second scroll and unfurled it, and this one Sakura could read. Hanzo continued to go on about his discovery, but Sakura had stopped listening in favor of reading the scroll. Anubis. Keldorn. Raksha. Oh. Here's QB, she suddenly pointed to the scroll, what's this name here? Leviton? Oh, no. There's some dispute among historians how to pronounce that one. He's a water demon who, every few hundred years, terrorizes ships at sea. Although we can never get all the pronunciations perfect because of the language gap, I like to call him Leviathan. Chapter 31, Things Long Forgotten Sakura shivered at the list of demonic names, just reading them gave her chills, so people used to worship all these demons? Yes, but that's not what's important. You probably aren't experienced enough to know this, but further down on the scroll there's instructions on how to commune with the demons, and the ritual is almost exactly the same as a summoning jutsu. Sakura was lost, so that means what exactly? I think that demons and summoning animals are the same thing. But then, why would we have two names for them? I'm sorry, Sakura-san, I was being imprecise. I believe they are the same type of creatures with one defining difference. What we call summoning animals become demons when they gain the ability to enter the human dimension without having to be summoned. Meaning? Hanzo flicked her forehead, of all the things ancient civilizations tried to record, one thing was paramount, their summoning contracts. So we can find those and cross-reference them with the descriptions of that chain demon. Don't get so excited, Sakura-san. It's a relatively small discovery, but it gets us one step closer to our goal. Dash. She knew perfectly well that he couldn't move, yet Seraphim found herself checking in on Kisame more and more frequently. It was something about the way he looked at her from his prone position in his hospital bed, like he knew some great secret and was keeping it from her just for the sake of his own amusement. She reached her hand towards the handle of his door, but suddenly retracted it when she heard movement from inside the room. It was an almost silent rustle, easily dismissed as that of shifting blankets, but Seraphim somehow knew was more than that. Silently promising to pay the hospital back, she kicked in the door with her sword drawn, stop whatever you're doing. Kisame looked up from his small table, hey Seraph. Wanna join me for lunch? The shark man looked like he had barely managed to get from his bed to the table at the side of the room, and had a tray of almost edible looking hospital food in front of him. I thought you were trying to escape, she said rather lamely. Kisame looked pointedly at the door now embedded in the wall across from where it had until recently swung on its hinges. Hmm, yeah, I noticed. I don't suppose it occurred to you that people very rarely go from mangled to completely healthy over the course of three hours. A sudden thought caused him to amend his previous statement, unless we were talking about Naruto, of course. Seraphim pulled the door from where it had landed and examined it dejectedly, this is going to cost a lot of money, and I'm not even getting paid for this so-called mission. A bite of what Kisame had decided to be plasti egg vanished into his razor-filled maw, I'd like to say that I've been trying to make this whole ordeal easier for you. Seraphim rolled her eyes, somehow I know how you're going to finish that sentence. Kisame smirked, I'd like to say it, but I'd be lying. Seraphim impulsively dropped into the chair across from Kisame and leaned against the wall, her voice becoming airy with a forced feeling of casualness, you really don't change, do you, Kisame? The man's expression turned wry not much, Seraph. I'm pretty much the same as I've always been. She reached and scooped up some of his mashed potato on her finger, popping it into her mouth, Blay they actually feed you this crap? It's not so bad once you get used to it. This tastes like sawdust, how could you get used to it? Kisame reached under the table and pulled out a bottle, just swish this around in your mouth for 30 seconds or so before you eat. Seraphim blanched, this is hot sauce. You wouldn't be able to taste anything after 30 seconds of swishing this around in your mouth. Exactly, he said as he took another bite of the plasti egg. Somehow I don't think I'll ever understand you. Kisame continued to eat until his tray was clean of anything resembling food, then lay back in his contentedly this may seem random, but have you ever regretted teaching me? Seraphim blinked. That was random. No. Really? Even when I used the skills you taught me to become a nuknin? I trusted you to make the right decision, and so I have always had faith that for you, becoming a nuknin was the right decision. Besides, you put fear back into the corrupt government of water country, 
So Hidden Mist might be better off this way. Kisame looked at the ceiling, better off, huh? Flashback. It was the beginning of winter, and there was just a hint of a chill in the air. A light wind blew over a large crowd of people, in which a young seraphim stood in awe of the stage set up in the center square of the village. The Mizukage was making a speech of some kind, but she was fully focused on the men who stood behind him. They were a newly established organization that stood above even the Anbu, and embodied the power of their village. They were the seven swordsmen of the mist. She knew all of their faces, and had even worked with a couple of them on missions, but they now seemed somehow more impressive, as if they became more powerful simply by virtue of now being, one of the seven swordsmen. The Mizukage finished his speech and her father stood up to say a few words, after which there was the obligatory applause and the seven filed off stage. The crowd started to disperse and Seraphim made her way around to where her father was talking with a couple of the seven in a small tent. A small group of people, mostly girls, had remained behind in hopes of meeting some of the legendary swordsmen, and so Seraphim stayed near the edge of the group. Normally she would have gone and joined her father in his discussion, but she didn't want to have to dig through fangirls to get there. Letting her eyes wander, she caught sight of movement near the back of the tent, where it looked like someone had just ducked out. Lacking anything better to do, she ducked out herself and ran along the outside edge of the tent until she caught sight of a man's back, hey you. He ignored her, which only spurred her on. Hey, I'm talking to you. Yes, you. Seraphim wasn't able to see the man's eyebrow twitch, but twitching it was, go away, woman. Hey. You're Hoshigaki. Why are you out here? He turned to glare at her, and she got her first good look at his face, people piss me off, so I'm going to where there aren't any people. He had now succeeded in pissing her off, don't be such a jackass. Next to being Mizukage, you were just given the highest honor available in the hidden mist, so the least you can do is be at least a little grateful. Kisame now turned fully round to face her, grateful? That's a riot, especially coming from you. Don't think I don't know who you are, girly. You're Sark's little princess daughter who's probably never even been in a real fight, so screw off before I get mad. Inside the tent, still chatting, Sark felt a disturbingly familiar chakra flare up seconds before explosions were heard. Dash. That night, Kisame and Seraphim got to share a cell. She picked up a small chunk of broken concrete and threw it at him, this is your fault, you know. How could this be, in any possible way, my fault? You attacked me. You provoked me. I provoke people all the time, but most of them don't go crazy and attack me. Seraphim tried to swing at him but a pain in her side flared up and she just landed on her face. Kisame whistled, got you good, didn't I? She groaned slightly, I'll admit that you're pretty strong for a fuckwad. You're not so bad yourself. For a psychotic bitch. Managing to get herself seated comfortably against the wall, Seraphim laughed, I'll take that as a compliment. But really, how did you get chosen to be one of the seven? What are you talking about? I got in because I'm strong. Maybe but your strategic skills are barely Janon level. She kicked his ankle for emphasis, and enjoyed watching him flinch. You nicked me, so what? There was an opening in your defenses. Your sword skills are near flawless, but you're open to attacks from things like, she kicked his ankle again, kunai. Still, the woman who got her side sliced shouldn't be lecturing me. I'm not lecturing, I'm just pointing out that someone as strong as you has such an easily fixable weakness, yet you don't do anything about it. Kisame waved his hand dismissively, if it was such an easy weakness to overcome, my teachers would have taught me by now. Even as Kisame said the words, a seed of doubt had been planted inside him, and Seraphim was having similar thoughts. It was extremely strange for someone like Kisame to have such an obvious chink in his defenses, particularly when all his other skills were off the charts. The woman continued to consider this conundrum and looked out through the bars into the small cell block contained in the basement of the police station. The two of them could easily break out of jail if they wanted to, but they stayed inside, in the same way that children go to their room when told, Shinobi stay in jail when ordered to so as to acknowledge authority. She was struck by realization and looked back at Kisame, authority. The man blinked, what? Dash. The next morning, they were let out of their cell and made a great show of snubbing each other and stomping off in different directions, but that night, they met in a clearing just outside the village wall. They continued to meet like that every night, and took only a week to discover that Seraphim's darkest suspicions had been correct. It took almost no time at all for Kisame to overcome some of his greatest weaknesses, and he soon fixed all the holes in his defense. They trained to exhaustion every night, and while the purpose was to help Kisame, Seraphim found that her own blade skills were being sharpened as well. 
After a month, they progressed from simple combat tactics to small group and large scale tactics, yet more areas where Kisame was horribly lacking. Contrary to his muscle man image, he absorbed information like a sponge, progressing faster than almost anyone Seraphim had ever seen. They went through massively complex theoretical battle situations of all types, and once the strategies were explained, Kisame never once made a mistake. As they worked more and more, both Seraphim and Kisame had to face what they had first discussed in that cell all those months ago. It was now clear that Kisame's training had been flawed, and not unintentionally. Seraphim estimated that ever since the age of 13, Kisame's teachers had been crippling him by leaving out large portions of training that all shinobi are supposed to have. After four months of the two training together, the cause of this became blindingly obvious. The higher-ups in the village were afraid of him, and with good reason. He had only months ago been the weakest of the seven swordsmen, and on a fresh day near the beginning on spring, he made a declaration before the Mizukage. Zabuza and Sage, ranked fifth and sixth in strength as far as the seven swordsmen went, were out on missions, so Kisame challenged the other four to face him in combat. The Mizukage figured it would at least make a good spectacle, so he allowed Kisame alone to take on the top four of the seven swordsmen all at once. It was indeed a spectacle, and a large portion of the village watched as Kisame calmly and methodically obliterated them. The village council and Mizukage watch in horror as more than ten years of conspiracy were blown away like dust in the wind as the top four shinobi in the village were publicly thrashed. Sark, who, although not involved, had known about the council's intentional limiting of Kisame's power, felt a sinking feeling in his belly as he watched his daughter smile triumphantly as the battle unfolded. Over the next few months, Kisame and Seraphim started to spend time together publicly, and whispers started to spread. They seemed like the last two people on earth to become friends, let alone more than friends, but even Sark had to admit that when they weren't trying to kill each other, they got along well. Many questioned Seraphim's taste, but everyone said it was only a matter of time before the two of them took their relationship to the next level. Unfortunately, fate had other plans. It was exactly a year after the formation of the Seven Swordsmen, and the Mizukage was hosting a dinner in their honor, but this day was especially important for Kisame. It was a day off for most shinobi, so Seraphim slept until noon, only to be woken up by someone shaking her enthusiastically. What the? Kisame? What happened to your hands? Kisame's hands were wrapped in bandages, but he paid them no mind and moved to one side so he could hold something up for her to see, it's called Seimata. It was just finished this morning. Still sleepy, she reached out and poked the strange blade with her finger, man, your brother is really something, this looks like one hell of a sword. I haven't really tested it out yet, but I can use it to absorb chakra. Amazing. Now let me sleep. Kisame sighed amusedly as Seraphim rolled over in bed and pointedly ignored him, fine, then, but I assume you will remember to get up in time to go to the dinner tonight? I won't forget, so let me sleep or I'll hurt you. Kisame stuck his tongue out at her but grabbed Seimata and made his way over to the door, you better get in time, or I'm going to tip you out of bed. He slipped out the door just in time to avoid a thrown pillow and vaulted over her apartment railing on the slightly wet ground below. Having a brand new sword, Kisame was faced with the constant temptation to try it out on things, and had to fight said temptation constantly as he wandered through the village. Finally deciding that he was going to go crazy if he couldn't smash something, Kisame made his way to one of the Jounin training fields. The field was empty, so Kisame stretched out his arms and lifted Seimata one-handed up to shoulder level while keeping his arm fully extended. He could definitely feel the difference in weight from his old sword, and he was going to suck in combat until he could compensate. He was just about to take his first swing when he heard the grass rustle behind him, Oi, fish for brains, you got a minute? That depends, Zabuza. What do you want me for? The devil of the mist shoved his hands in his pockets, I'm not generally a helpful person, Kisame, but I figure you're the least idiotic of the people around here, so I'm going to give you a little warning. Kisame shifted his sword from his right hand to his left, a warning about what? The Mizukage received word of your new sword being finished and immediately called a special council meeting. They're in there right now discussing whether to have you assassinated in your sleep. There was a dull thumb as Seimata hit the ground, having fallen from Kisame's now limp hand. Zabuza looked at the fallen sword with mild interest, hmm. That new blade of yours does look first rate, I can see why the Mizukage is in a panic. Oh, and of course, if anyone asks, we never had this conversation. Zabuza's image blurred and he vanished with a poof, leaving Kisame alone in the training field. The shark man just stood there, unmoving, his brain devoting all its power to figuring out what he was supposed to do now. 
Even he had never dreamed the council would go so far as to order him killed, but Zabuza had no reason to deceive him and as he thought about it, he really wouldn't put anything past a council that had conspired for years just to keep him weak. As the day passed, he continued to stand in the same spot, and after almost three hours of no movement, he reached down and grasped Samata by the hilt, so they think they can kill me, do they? He held the sharkskin blade in the air, and couldn't help but notice that there was no sign of the heaviness from earlier. He smiled then, and his smile slowly widened into the malevolent and slightly manic grin for which he would, from that day on, be famous. We'll see who kills who. Dash. He arrived to pick her up at the agreed time, but Seraphim couldn't help but feel that there was something wrong with Kisame as they went to the dinner. His eyes seemed cold and distant, like his mind was somewhere else. They split up at the entrance to the dining hall since Kisame had to go sit at the table for the seven swordsmen and Seraphim was expected to sit at the head table with her father. Kisame sat and took in the room, everyone here was a potential enemy, waiting to spear him when he was least expecting. Poke. He almost jumped out of his chair as he felt a poke in his side and looked down. A small girl was poking him in the side, apparently oblivious to his anxiety. He grabbed her arm and she looked up at him innocently, Hello, Kisame-sama. Zabuza sat down on the other side of the little girl, Don't be a nuisance, Mako. Ah. But I want to play with Kisame-san. You have to be quiet now, but I'll let you swim in the lake after, okay? Mako carefully considered her uncle's offer in her unique six-year-old way, way. Swimming. The Mizukage stood up and started to talk. In fact, most of what the Mizukage did was talk, to the point where that became his primary skill. This was the type of thing Seraphim pondered as he made his speech. She glanced at Kisame and a shiver went down her spine. His eyes looked so cold compared to usual, there was none of the fire his eyes usually concealed. She resolved to talk to him about it later and was just about to look away when she heard a sudden grating cough. The little girl next to Kisame spewed out a stream of milk that engulfed her entire table and thus, the seven swordsmen of the mist. Mako coughed a few more times as Zabuza patted her on the back. Once she caught her breath she looked up at the milk-drenched swordsman, sorry. Dash. From that day on, it felt to Seraphim like Kisame was drifting farther and farther away from humanity. He had always been a loner, but now she was the only one in the village who ever saw him. He spent the majority of his time practicing with Seimata on the outskirts of the village and would rarely give her more than two or three word responses, when he would talk to her at all. He sunk deeper and deeper into himself, until the first day of spring, fifteen months after they had met, when he told her to meet him in the third training field at midnight. She approached the pitch-black clearing with a sense of trepidation, not sure what to expect, but Kisame was just standing in the middle of the field casually leaning Seimata against his shoulder. He looked over to her as she approached and smiled his first real smile in months, I'm glad you came, Seraph. What are you up to, Kisame? I know you, and you're planning something big. Don't talk, Seraphim, just listen. Tonight is the last time we're ever likely to see each other, so I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. You've been good to me, and next few days will be hard on you, but as it turns out, all I can say is sorry. Hey wait. You can't just say something like that and. Kisame was gone and Seraphim was left alone in the field. The next morning, Anbu broke her door down, Ikana Seraphim, we are sorry to intrude, but under orders of the Mizukage, we are taking you into custody as the last known person to see Hoshigaki Kisame, who as of 27 minutes ago, is registered as a missing nin of the hidden mist. End flashback. Seraphim started to get uneasy as Kisame continued to stare at the ceiling, and was about to call for a nurse when he suddenly broke out of his reverie, do you remember what I told you the last time we saw each other in Hidden Mist? Of course, you said you were sorry. Kisame lowered his gaze so he was looking at her again, I hate to say this Seraph, but I need to apologize again. For what? You haven't done anything this time. In fact, you've made my father happier than he's been in ages. As she was speaking, some part of Seraphim's brain realized something rather significant. Kisame's eyes weren't focused quite as one would expect. He wasn't looking at her, but past her. She instinctually pivoted, and realized her mistake nanoseconds too late as she was entranced by two burning red orbs in what was otherwise a suddenly pitch-black room. She collapsed in a heap and Kisame hopped up from his chair, snapping off his casts. Thanks, Itachi. Let's roll. Did we really have to delay our escape by six days? Yeah, I had some things that I had to ask. This woman makes you unusually emotional. Itachi observed coolly. That's true, Kisame conceded as he pulled on his shirt, she makes me act irrationally and go against my better judgment, 
even to the point of delaying our escape. He paused to pull on his shoes, she makes me lose my cool and leaves my emotions in a mess. Put succinctly, she completely screws me up. Kisame took a moment to admire his now fully clothed form in the mirror, and then strode past the Uchiha towards the doorless door, and if you're really lucky Itachi, someday you'll meet someone who will do the same for you. Dash. They had been running to the point of collapse, but Naruto watched the gathering storm and knew they weren't going to make it. He wasn't sure about exactly what was following them, but he knew they weren't going to escape it. Or at least, he wasn't. He grabbed Tamari's arm, stop. What? You almost made me fall. How far are we from hidden sand? About. Eight hours, I'd guess. Naruto looked at the ground, eight hours. The only way either of us is going to survive this is if you go on without me. Tamari whacked him upside the head, I am not leaving you here just so you can be heroic. I'm not suggesting it to be heroic. I'm saying it's the only way we are going to survive. With the help of Gara and some San Nin, we might stand a chance against what's after me, but not otherwise. So then what are you going to do until I get back with help? Naruto smiled easily, I'm going to wait for you. She grabbed a clump of his hair and kissed him roughly, you better stay alive. No problem, I promise. Tamari ran into the desert night with a new vigor, and Naruto watched her go with mixed feelings. Even at his most optimistic, he had maybe two hours before whatever it was got to him. It was eight hours to hidden sand, and then another eight back, so he would have to hold his ground for fourteen straight hours. He collapsed on his back and looked up at the moon. I'll try to keep my promise Tamari, he covered his eyes with one hand, I'll try with everything I have, but... Dash. An hour and ten minutes later, Tamari passed through another village and decided she had to eat something. As much as she wanted to keep running, she knew she would collapse without sustenance. The first thing she saw was a ramen stand, so she stumbled in and demanded a bowl of pork ramen as fast as it could be made. She lay her head on the counter and looked hazily at the man next to her, Hey, mister. What's this place called? What? This town, what's it called? It's called Ocean, but are you alright? Tamari laughed semi-deliriously, Ha! Huh? A place in the desert called Ocean. But I need to remember, an hour south of Ocean. An hour south of Ocean. An hour south of Ocean. The man rubbed his head, Miss, I really think you should go to a hospital or something. Her pork ramen arrived and Tamari grabbed the bowl and left the stand. The owner looked stunned, Hey! That's my bowl! And you didn't pay for the ramen. Tamari looked back, Charge it to hidden sand. At the other end of the ramen bar, a man sat perplexed as Tamari ran off. Had she really not recognized him? Was she playing dumb as part of some plan? Was she on some kind of drug? The more he thought, the more confused he got, but he figured he had one clue. An hour south, huh? Dash. Naruto opened his eyes and sat up, how long have you been there? Fifty feet away, Sark smiled, oh, just a couple minutes. Awfully considerate of you to let me sleep. I came all this way to fight you, Naruto-kun, not kill you, he smiled wider, though I can't promise I won't. Naruto stood up and reached into his mind, all right, bastard fox. If there was ever a time to fight your hardest, this is it. To his surprise, the response was both immediate and strong, I will. The fox seemed really riled up, the last time Naruto remembered him being this energetic was when he fought Gara. His hand suddenly clenched around Sarei Kirite's handle, impossible. Sark threw his staff to one side and formed a single seal, I hope you won't mind, Naruto-kun, if I start off at full power. And by full power, I of course mean, his eyes suddenly narrowed, Leviathan. Chakra exploded outward and Sark watched as Naruto struggled to fight against the waves of blue energy with disappointment, I may have vastly overestimated you, Naruto-kun, if you can't even stand up to a little raw chakra. With a sigh of annoyance, Sark drew a kunai and vanished in a blur, appearing behind the boy and driving it towards his skull. The old man was more than surprised to hear the clang of metal on metal. The old man was suddenly blown back and dug his feet into the sand as a vortex of crimson chakra consumed the boy. Naruto looked at him with unholy fire in his eyes, Don T fuck with me, old man. There's no way Itachi and Kisame would have lost to that kind of pathetic strength. Sark looked delighted, wonderful, Naruto-kun. This will be even more fun than I imagined. The boy's voice had a demonic edge to it, I suppose now you're going to show me your full power? Hardly. I wouldn't be much of a shinobi unless I kept a few tricks in reserve, but then again, I'm not much of a swordsman without a sword, now am I? Saying this, he rolled up his right sleeve, 
revealing a complex tattoo that the blue chakra seemed to condense on. The tattoo suddenly glowed bright red and there was a poof of smoke, which blew away almost immediately to reveal the largest sword Naruto had ever seen. His response was therefore appropriate, damn. That's a big sword. It's called Jayakur Yuu, and I haven't used it in combat for seven years now, so this is quite an event for me. You didn't use that thing on Itachi and Kisame? I didn't need to. Whether you intended to or not, Naruto-kun, you have chosen the perfect battlefield to face me on. How do you mean? Leviathan can control water, so with his help it's easy to surround my feet with an inch-thick bubble that allows me to move at three or four times my normal speed, but here. Naruto grinned, no water. And any you did accumulate on your feet would be sucked up by the sand. So it would appear, Sark said as he hefted the massive bastard sword, that our speeds are now almost even. Naruto knew he was still slower, but now had built up some confidence. Sark was not invincible, and from the way the blue and red chakra vortexes were pushing against each other, the old man was about even with him in chakra capacity as well. Unfortunately, the boy knew he was vastly inferior with regards to technique, so if he was going to hold out, he would have to attack hard, fast, and when Sark was least expecting it. If fact, with the old man's eyes closed and him looking rather out of it, right then seemed like a pretty good time. He burst forward and adjusted his hand grip for an upwards cross cut. Sark opened one eye, foolish. He brought the massive blade to bear faster than Naruto would have though possible, so fast in fact, that Naruto could barely follow its trail. He was only more confused though, once he did see its trail. Even with its size, the sword was moving so fast it was going to complete its swing before he was in the strike zone, in other words, it was going to miss him. Naruto enjoyed a moment of bliss before he realized that an opponent of this caliber wasn't likely to make such a mistake. Sark's single open eye narrowed to a slit and pulsed with dark light, Kamaitachi. Unable to even think of evasion, Naruto ran headlong into the shockwave and was sent hurling backwards, slamming into a sand dune with a dull crunch. Naruto pulled himself out of the sand, well, that wasn't a very good idea. And with a name like Jayakur Yu, I wasn't even thinking. Sark smiled amiably again, to define it, Jayakur Yu is a stretch of turbulent water in a river or the sea caused by one current flowing into or across another current. In other words, Naruto coughed and spit out some blood, a riptide. Signs. First Omake. The specs of Jayakur Yu, riptide. A 12-foot bastard sword having an 8-foot blade and 4-foot handle, Jayakur Yu stands as the largest weapon in my Naotoverse. Bastard swords are designed and weighted to be usable with one or two hands, primarily with two, a fact that shouldn't change as you increase the size, making them extremely versatile as far as swords go. They have straight double-edged blades and are a kinf of hybrid between a long sword and two-handed sword. Initially, I mistakenly referred to bastard sword as as being another name for long sword, which, after further research, I have discovered is untrue. Today we learn that Wikipedia is not always right. Jayakur Yu gets its name from the fact that if swung at a specific angle and with sufficient velocity, a vacuum is created directly behind the blade, which in turn creates powerful and turbulent winds. Designed to catch its victims off guard, Jayakur Yu is a weapon to be feared. Second Omake. This is actually how I first wrote this scene, but I realized as soon as I was finished that it was way too silly. Saying this, he rolled up his right sleeve, revealing a complex tattoo that the blue chakra seemed to condense on. The tattoo suddenly glowed bright red and there was a poof of smoke, which blew away almost immediately to reveal the largest sword Naruto had ever seen. His response was therefore appropriate, damn. That's a big sword. It's called Jayakur Yu, and I haven't used it in combat for seven years now, so this is quite an event for me. But seriously, Naruto said blankly, that's a really big sword. How do you even swing it? Sark's eyebrow twitched, as I was saying, few have ever seen its blade, let alone had the honor of facing it in Komba. I mean. Naruto interrupted, it's just so big. Sere Kirite is a pretty good size, but that thing is just excessive. I see why you keep it sealed, because I sure wouldn't want to walk down the street carrying that thing. It's huge. Like, Godzilla-sized. Or maybe it's the Megazord sword from Power Rangers. Sark's patience snapped, stop talking over me. Chapter 32, Interlude, The Dark Secret Meeting Room Sasuke and Kabuto sat on the side of a hill, looking dejectedly at their surroundings. The medicnin pushed his glasses up his nose, so even after all our hard work, we find ourselves unable to proceed. How vexing. We'll find the entrance soon, 
all it takes is a little patience. Maybe Itachi got the location wrong. It might be on the other side of the hill. It's worth a look, I guess. Pushing themselves up, the two made their way around mound of rock and dirt. Not a minute later, the ground where they had been sitting opened up, and Datara walked tentatively into the sunlight, damn, it's so bright out here. I'm going to kill Sasori for making me look for him. Mumbling curses, Datara headed off towards the nearby village in search of the puppet user as the secret door closed silently, leaving no trace of its presence. Sasuke and Kabuto returned to their original spot even more discouraged, and Sasuke was fighting the urge to start throwing around some fire justice, there was no sign of anything on the other side, and I doubt Itachi would make a mistake like that anyway, but I still don't see a door here. Well, if we wait here, someone will have to use the door eventually, and we'll be here when they do. Dash 30 seconds later. I'm Buo Oort. Shut up, Kabuto. Here's an idea. How about we just blow up the hill? Allow me to rephrase, shut up or I'll gut you. I think Sasuke-sama needs to lighten up a bit. After all, Sasuke-sama, it can't be fun to be that uptight all the time. I like Sasuke-sama best when Sasuke-sama is optimistic and positive. Oh for the love of. Don't start that again. Don't start what? Don't call me Sasuke-sama. Why, Sasuke-sa? Sasuke dove at him and had just managed to get his hands around the scrawny medic nin's neck when they heard a twig snap. Sasuke shoved Kabuto into a bush and dove in after him, putting them in a position that would have been awkward if they weren't so on edge. Datara stomped up the hill, dragging Sasori behind her, we're an hour late for the fucking meeting. Where have you been all this time? The massive figure that was Sasori held a plastic bag filled with boxes, I was shopping, and the store was having a special today. The first 600 in line got a free special edition Goku. Dragon Ball Z action figures are not as important as top secret Akatsuki meetings. That's just your opinion. No, it's the way things are. In the bush, Kabuto and Sasuke watched the two Akatsuki pass by, then walk into the gaping hole that suddenly opened in the earth. As soon as the art closed, they jumped up and ran to examine where there had just been an opening. Sasuke whistled softly, the seam is perfect. Even my Sharigan can't tell there's a door here. Kabuto's leg hit something and he bent down to pick it up. Hey! That guy dropped one of his figures. Really? Sasuke said semi-interestedly, which one? It's a special edition Goku figure. Sasuke's brain made the connection just as the earth opened up again. Oh crap. Dash. Five sat in a dark room. One might question why the Akatsuki always felt the need to hold their secret meetings in dark rooms. After all, it wasn't like they didn't all know each other and they were 50 feet underground, but the leader thought the dark made the secret meeting seem more secret. Unfortunately, two members had yet to appear, so right now they were just five people who were feeling rather silly sitting in a dark room. It was then that Datara burst into the room, we have a problem. Garm, head of the Akatsuki, looked up sharply, report. I was returning with Sasori from the village and we saw these two guys feeling each other up in a bush but ignore them cause we wanted to get back but once we got inside Sasori noticed that his special edition Goku figure was missing and he went back outside and saw the two guys with his figure and thought they stole it even though they really just found it on the ground and it also turns out that they have Akatsuki cloaks and weren't just two guys feeling each other up in a bush because I'm pretty sure one of them is an Uchiha but Sasori is trying to kill them while raving about people stealing his Goku action figures. The other two teams were looking at Datara strangely, and Garm was fighting off an impending migraine. Dash. Once Sasori had been calmed down and his figure returned to him, Sasuke and Kabuto had to face the Akatsuki. The Uchiha scanned the room, why is it so dark in here? Garm coughed into his hand, that's not important. I have received word that the mission assigned to Kisame and Itachi was successful, but you must explain to me how you did it. Well, Sasuke began, I knew that there was no way we could get into the Mark's house without setting off any traps, so I had to modify a special genjutsu. Kabuto and I advanced into the grounds and the alarms went off, which we expected. We managed to evade the guards for quite a while, but when they did catch us, it was my turn to use my new jutsu. Flashback. A group of four guards cornered them in the hallway, stop. Sasuke looked on calmly and waved his hand, don't worry, we're not the intruders you're looking for. The guard's eyes glazed over and one turned to the others, these aren't the intruders we're looking for. Sasuke waved his hand again, you're beginning to suspect this alarm is just a diversion so the lady of the house can kill her husband. Another guard nodded sagely to his companions, I'm beginning to suspect this alarm is just a diversion so the mistress can kill her husband. 
The hand was waved a third time, the rest of you agree. The other three guards nodded, we agree. One final wave of the hand, you never saw us here. Sasuke and Kabuto ran down the hall and around the corner as the guards nodded in unison, we never saw you here. The first guards blinked at his companions, what were we talking about, again? And flashback. After that, Sasuke continued, it was just a matter of repeating the process a couple times, then finding the wife of the house and putting a genjutsu on her so she thought her husband was an evil space alien trying to suck out her brain. He dies, we escape, wife takes the blame. Bada bing, bada boom, bada bang. Garm stroked his chin in that way that only evil geniuses do, hmm. Not a bad mission result, and Itachi endorsed you, so I'll let you join for now. If you want to stay members, I expect a 100% mission success rate. We were going to have a meeting about how to replace the AWOL Team 1, but now we have replacements. Since Datara and Sasori made us all wait for an hour to start a meeting which we now don't need to have, they get to be the lucky ones to show our newest members around the compound. Dismissed. Everyone filed out of the dark secret meeting room and Sasuke and Kabuto, having no idea where to go, just waited for Datara and Sasori to start their tour. The blonde just stomped past them while Sasori hung back so as to follow them. And so their little procession made its way through the twisting halls until they reached a door. This, Datara said, kicking open the door, is the cloak room. Here we have all the Akatsuki cloaks you could ever want. You guys might want to change yours. Kabuto decided he just might do that, but Sasuke shook his head, no thanks, I'll keep this one. Sasori looked down, strange. Your brother used to say the same thing. He was the only one of us who never changed his cloak. Really? Him and I do have our similarities, I suppose. Datara snapped on a new cloak, similarities? Listen, kid, if you were taller, ate Pocky all the time, and were a bit more of a jackass, I wouldn't be able to tell the two of you apart. Now let's move on to the next room. Sasori being the closest to the door, led them down the hall to another door, which he slid open, here we have the cool hat room, which has both regular hats and hats with little white dangly things, which make you look more mysterious but also make it kind of hard to see. Kabuto looked like he was in heaven, and went straight for the white dangly thing hats, throwing one on, being able to see as a small price to pay for looking this good. Datara nodded, finally, someone who understands the importance of cool hats. Sasori always says they're stupid. Ignoring the room of hats, Sasuke looked curiously up at the San Nin, that's a puppet, right? Yeah. So, to really make eye contact with you, I'd have to look at your chest or neck? I suppose. Doesn't it feel weird to have people always looking above your eye level when talking to you? In all Sasori's years of living inside a puppet, it had never bothered him. Until that moment. No, he said semi-convincingly. Sasuke just shrugged, whatever you say. Dash. Their tour continued on for another hour, and the last thing they were shown was what would be their room. They had bunk beds. As the two older Akatsuki were just about to leave, Sasuke grabbed Sasori's arm and gestured for him to stay. Once Datara was gone, the Uchiha closed the door and fought down his nervousness. Now I understand this may be a strange question, Sasori-san, but I need to ask. Your partner, Datara. We've spent the last hour together, but I can't for the life of me tell if Datara is a guy or a girl. Kabuto sighed, even for a medic nin like me. I couldn't tell at all. Sasori made his way over to a large stool that sat down, what you have just asked is a question that has plagued me for years now. It doesn't matter which gender I use when referring to him, she never makes any effort to correct me. I've just gotten into the habit of switching genders with every pronoun. Data gender is a mystery to everyone as far as I know. Garm might have figured it out, since he gives physical examinations to everyone when they join, but he's not telling anyone. Sasuke looked nervous, physical examinations? like testing for torture resistance and stuff? No, like a stick out your tongue and say ah kind of physical examination. He likes to know the bodies of his subordinates so he knows their weaknesses if they ever revolt. Still, how can you share a room with someone and not know what gender they are? Many would ask how Datara can stand to room with a guy who lives in a puppet. Kabuto stretched out on his bed, touche. Sasori rose and made his way to the door, you can try to spy on Datara in the shower if you want but no one has ever managed to see him naked. If you do try to peep on her though, remember to get some sleep. You'll work hard tomorrow. Sasuke climbed up onto his bunk, thank you for the tour. The San Nin let out a laugh as he walked out the door, welcome to the Akatsuki. I'll be interested to see if you run survive your first assigned mission. 
The door closed behind him and the Uchiha looked up at the ceiling with a smirk, you bet your big puppet ass we will. Chapter 33, Promises Kept. Sark watched Naruto with something akin to amusement as the boy circled him slowly. Sark had thwarted numerous attack runs, all using the Kamaitachi, and Naruto just kept getting blasted back. The old man walked sideways over the sand, keeping in rhythm with Naruto's circling, do you know what the problem is with Shinobi today, Naruto-kun? The boy was focusing his attention on regenerating a part of his arm that had been slashed, but wasn't going to waste an opportunity to stall for time, no, what? None of the young people today have any respect for power, since none of them had to earn it. All the kiddies rely on their blood limits these days, or in your case, a demon. Naruto glanced at his arm, it was 40% healed, what about you then? You use demonic energy too, and even have a tenkin. Wrong, Naruto-kun. I worked harder than anyone growing up. When other students in my dojo trained 5 hours, I trained 10. At 16, I designed and hand-forged Jayakura Yuu, which by the way isn't a Tenkan, but an ordinary sword that uses some simple principles of physics. By 20 I had designed a new type of summoning tattoo so I would always have my sword on hand. The boy looked again at his arm, which was now almost fully healed, so what? When I was 31, I was an elite guard for a merchant ship. Our vessel was attacked by a sea demon and I beat the bastard with nothing more than a sword and my wits. Naruto paused for a moment, I guess I have to give you that one. Beating a demon is pretty damned impressive, but that was a long time ago and the world has changed. Oh really? If you think you can beat me using your borrowed power, I dare you to try. Naruto gritted his teeth in frustration. His arm was healed, but Sark was holding back, obviously mocking him. None of his usual strategies were going to work, since he had to assume that with his experience, Sark knew everything Kisame had taught him and most of the things Itachi had taught him. Naruto supposed that the old man's comments about borrowed power might not have been that far off, since to win he would have to improvise. He ran through a mental list of all the jutsus he knew, and something resembling an idea started to form. Sark had been using the Kamaitachi almost exclusively so far, and that wasn't likely to last, but if Naruto could strike while the old man was still overconfident, he might have a chance. The boy took a moment to pull off his shoes while the old man whistled carelessly, and he tossed the boots to one side, digging his feet into the sand and ensuring he had good traction. All right, geezer, get ready to eat your words. Sark yawned dismissively as Naruto started what appeared to be another blind frontal assault. All right then, Naruto-kun, let's kick it up a notch. Jayakuryu cut through the air, Daikamaitachi. A cloud of sand was kicked up as the wind tore across the desert, but Sark didn't hear an impact implying Naruto had evaded the blast. The old man surveyed the empty landscape, but there was no sign of the boy. Then he heard it. It was an almost inaudible high-pitched whine, and it set his teeth on edge. Sword clones burst from the dust cloud and closed on him from all directions. Sark counted four, six, eight, nine swords total. Interesting, the old man thought, he replicates his throne sword and the demon's chakra allows their flight to be controlled. Sark started to rotate Jayakuryu over his head, passing the blade from hand to hand as it steadily built up momentum. Once it was up to speed, he twisted the sword about his body like a baton twirler. The wind created kicked up sand, forming a miniature sandstorm surrounding him. The first of the Sere Kirite clones was vaporized upon contact with this cyclonic barrier of wind and chakra, to be quickly followed by the second, third, fourth, and fifth sword clones. As his attention shifted to the sixth blade, he felt the sands beneath him shift. Just as the sixth clone was banished, a hand burst from the desert and Sark was faced with an orb of chakra being propelled towards his nose. The old man brought Jayakura Yuu down and obliterated the cage bunshine, dissolving the Rasengan, but in doing so he embedded half Jayakura Yuu's blade in the sand. With three spinning blades bearing down on him, his sword was immobilized. Very well done, Naruto. Very well done indeed. He slammed his left hand into the desert, Kushios no Jutsu. The final three sword clones vanished with a muted poof and Naruto, hiding in a dune a few hundred feet away, felt a cold feeling settle in his belly as a massive cloud of smoke filled his vision. The smoke cleared slowly, and a massive serpentine form lifted its head into the desert sky. Naruto had faced Orochimaru's giant serpents, but even Manda paled when compared to the monster that was now fixating its gaze on his hiding spot. What is this, Sark? Have you become so weak that even with my chakra, you cannot defeat a child? Oh, shut up, Leviathan. It's not like you had anything better to do today. I'll have you know that I was in the middle of a very nice dream about mermaids. You interrupted my mermaid dream. 
You can dream about mermaids any day, but how often do you get to face another of your own kind? Have you gone senile, old man? We're in a fucking desert. How many sea serpents do you know who hang out in deserts? All I see is a brat hiding in a pile of sand. Not a sea serpent you dumbass, a demon. The brat hiding in the pile of sand is a demon? Generally, I expect demons to be more than 5 feet tall, and scarier than mozzarella cheese, and I have seen cheese way scarier than that runt. Naruto, despite the immediate threat to his life, wanted to correct the demon by saying that he was at least five and a half feet tall, but decided he would have to restrain himself to take full advantage of the bickering going on between Sark and Leviathan. Hey, bastard fox, got any ideas? I have one, but... Yeah, I was thinking that too, but Therese a pretty good chance that I'll die in the process, so I am really not a fan of that strategy. Well, fighting as you are now guarantees that you'll die. Sark may have become a softy in his old age, but Leviathan will kill you without a second thought. Or even a first thought, for that matter. So I have no choice then? Not really. Unless you want to fall on your knees and beg for forgiveness, which is always an option. Naruto looked up, alright then, here goes nothing. There were 37 seals to this jutsu, and he remembered them as well as the day he had first used it. By the time Sark noticed that Naruto was actually doing something, 15 seals had been completed. By the time Sark managed to point it out to Leviathan that Naruto was actually doing something, 30 seals had been completed. The serpent snapped forward, intending to finish the boy with one bite, but the final seal had been completed. Naruto streaked a line of blood across his belly, Shikifuge and Kai. His final thought was, shit. I'd forgotten how much this hurt. Dash. Skimming across the sands, Tamari was making excellent time. She had made it to the village in 7 hours, and with just a 10 minute turnaround, she was now moving at high speed on a platform of sand along with Gara and a squad of sand Anbu. A trip which she had originally thought would take 16 hours was going to be completed in just a little more than half that, but she was still anxious about what they might find. They were still a great many miles away, but Gara suddenly poked her in the shoulder, look. She did, and was almost blinded by the light. Though still far in the distance, a section of desert was reflecting light like a mirror, blinding anyone who looked directly at it. Go faster, Tamari said suddenly, go faster. Dash. When they finally arrived, Gara lowered his sand platform and everyone disembarked, moving like zombies. The Anbu commander couldn't keep a stutter out of his voice, impossible. Not even. He looked at Gara fearfully, but the sand boy shook his head, no, even I couldn't do a thing like this. Right in the middle of the desert, there was a square mile of glass. Tamari just stared, ignoring the others, because she knew exactly the kind of power that would be needed for something like this, and the only way that power could have been released. Naruto did it. That bastard broke the seal. The Anbu leader looked at her skeptically, highly unlikely, Tamari-sama. Humans can't handle a third this much chakra. Anyone who ran this kind of energy through their body would be completely incinerated from the inside out. Resisting the urge to squish the Anbu leader, Gara grabbed hold of his sister's arm, listen to me Tamari, you have to explain everything that's happened. She shook him off, it doesn't matter if he's dead, Gara. We don't know that. What the hell are you talking about? The sand was liquefied for a quarter mile in every direction and all that power came from inside Naruto. Not even he could survive that. Gara didn't know what to say. He wanted to believe in Naruto's invincibility, but he would be deluding himself. He looked to the Anbu, search the area for this Sark. If he is found I want him brought to hidden sand immediately. I'm going to take Tamari back now, the rest of you can run. Grabbing Tamari's arm again, he directed her away from the Anbu then lifted the two of them off the ground, heading back to hidden sand as fast as possible. Dash. Naruto smelled something. It was a unique smell, there wasn't another like it in the world, and it was one that hadn't tickled his nose for a very long time. He couldn't see anything and wondered if his nose might be deceiving him, but his nose had never been wrong before. I smell instant ramen. Pork variety. With chicken stock used instead of water, a little soy sauce added, chives, paprika, horseradish, and a dollop of sour cream on top. It's almost done. I hadn't planned on your coming around so fast. The voice was muffled, but Naruto would know that voice if he was hearing it underwater, Iruka sensei. This is a surprise. It must be my unlucky day. Hardly. You should be dead right now. It occurred to Naruto that the last thing he remembered doing was unsealing the demonic chakra in his stomach, maybe you have a point there. How did my fight with Sark end up, anyway? 
I can't say I even know who you're talking about. I just found you in a field of viscous liquid sand suffering from what's honestly the worst case of chakra burns I've ever seen. Weird. Nothing on my body hurts. That's because your body was so badly damaged that you don't have any feeling in most of it. Then why can I hear, smell and talk? There are virtually no chakra pathways in your ears, tongue and nose. Hmm, I didn't know that. Is the ramen done yet? Not quite. Your sight should be coming back pretty quickly, and the rest of your body should regain feeling within an hour or so. Cool. What have you been up to recently? Pretty much just hunting you, actually. I headed for Hidden Sand right after the mess in Konoha, and have been traveling around the country of wind ever since. I figured out that there are only three main towns directly between the borders of wind country and Hidden Sand, so I've been patrolling from one to another in hopes of running across your trail. You people never give up, do you? The village did, I didn't. I've been using my vacation time to go after you, if Tsunade found out, she'd have my hide. So how did you find me anyway? I saw Tamari in Ocean an hour north, she was all rattled up and mumbling directions. I followed them, and found you. Wait. How long was I out? Half a day, so eleven or twelve hours. Phew. I still have another couple hours. How far are we from where you found me? Just an hour. We're in ocean again, and I just found an abandoned warehouse and set up a camp stove. Naruto suddenly noticed that he was able to see blurs now, and turned his head to look at the blur that was Iruka, an excellent segue to my next statement. Is the ramen done yet? Yes, actually. Pork ramen with chicken stock instead of water, a little soy sauce, chives, paprika, horseradish, and a dollop of sour cream on top. Just the way you like it. Wait. Making my favorite kind of ramen. You want something from me, don't you? Well, I'd like you to renounce everything you've done, come back to the village, apologize to the Hokage and pay your debt to society. Or, you could think of this as a ramen to celebrate the fact that you haven't gotten yourself killed yet. You know, Iruka, I don't remember you being this cynical. Things have changed a little since the last time we met. That's true, at least. His sight now good enough to distinguish his hand from his body, he held out his arm as Iruka Blob held out ramen blob. Naruto slowly closed his hand around the object he couldn't feel, do I have it yet? A bit more. There. Now holding the cup of ramen, Naruto just tilted his head back and drank the whole thing, ah. That was good. You do realize that I spent nearly 10 minutes making that for you. I was hungry, and I really can't use chopsticks right now. Are you seeing better? A little, still just shapes, though. Though Naruto couldn't see it, Iruka took off his mask and dug around in his pocket for a cigarette, lighting it on his camp stove, you know something, Naruto? I've spent more time than I want to admit thinking about what I was going to say to you when I finally found you, but now that I'm here, none of it seems appropriate. We've talked a thousand times, so why would you need to plan it this time? Put like that, I have to admit it was pretty stupid of me. I'm not going far for a while, so tell me what's going on in Konoha. Iruka blew a cloud of smoke into the air, you mean apart from all the madness that you caused? I deserve that, but Itachi wasn't about to let his brother get killed, and the only time anyone got hurt is when you attacked us. I don't understand you. Sasuke broke the law. Not only that, his leaving was the catalyst that made you run away. Yes, Sasuke broke the law, but the law is wrong. And yes, his leaving was one of the factors that drove me to run away, but running away turned out really well for me. How can you enjoy living this way? Spending every day afraid? Afraid? Who am I supposed to be afraid of, you? The other leaf hunters? You're sent on missions by superiors, sometimes those missions will almost assuredly end in death, but you are forced to do it anyway. I, on the other hand, do only missions I want to. Why should I be afraid? It's frightening to be alone, though. As a Nuknin, you don't have a village to support you when you're in trouble. Ah, your logic fails again. Sasuke was a Nuknin, and when he was in trouble other Nuknin supported him. Not only that, his few supporters took on your entire village and won by a landslide. Iruka didn't like all the weaknesses in his argument, do you really like being a Nuknin that much? You never miss anything about Konoha? I used to be a lot more polarized about it, but I've come to accept that there are a lot of people in the village I hate, but there are as many that I'm indifferent to and a few I actually like. The thing is that I'm not willing to put up with the people I hate just to be in the presence of a few people I like. I still can't see that being a good enough reason to just abandon your village. Iruka, you and I agree on a lot of things, but not this, so let's just not talk about this, okay? 
I originally asked you how things were in Konoha. Really, they're pretty much the same. Neji trains constantly in hopes of beating you someday, Kuji eats a lot, Shikamaru whines, etc., etc., etc. There must be something. Iruka blew another cloud of smoke into the air, well, I was only there for a little while, but after you and your demon pal tore up the city, Sakura started spending all her spare time in the archives. It took her a day and a half to learn more about demonology than any other shinobi in the village save Hanzo himself, and she shows no signs of slowing. I really didn't want to hear about her, you know. In fact, I would have rather you talked about that ugly old fruit stand lady who used to make me pay five times market price than talk about Sakura. You really have some issues with her. Naruto reflected for a moment, maybe a couple. You didn't part on very good terms, but of everyone in Konoha, she spent more time thinking and worrying about you than anyone else. That won't work, I've perfected the art of apathy. Nothing you say can make me care. Sakura was depressed for weeks after you left. Don't care. She cried herself to sleep every night. Hear that? It's the sound of me not caring. Despite what Naruto said, guilt was starting to poke at him. She forgave you. Naruto bit back his planned witty reply, what? The boy still couldn't see that well, so Iruka allowed himself a triumphant smile, you heard me. I've had a lot of discussions with many people about you, and Sakura is the only one who told me that she couldn't hold what you had done against you. The guilt was now stabbing him through the few chinks in his emotional armor, damn it. You've made me care. I've always been good at that, though you are pretty predictable. More importantly, though, is what you're going to do now. Now you want me to do something? Iruka ground the stub of his cigarette into the floor, part of being a man is paying recompense for your mistakes, so I want you to at least think about what you could do for Sakura. If I promise to think about it will you make me more ramen? Sounds like a fair deal to me, but you better seriously think and not just stare off into space. Naruto thought about it for all of 30 seconds, got bored of it, and decided he'd think about it later. The next nine and a half minutes were occupied by him staring off into space. Iruka noticed the boy's inattention almost immediately, but figured he had at least set things in motion. After adding the various toppings, he helped Naruto maneuver the second cup of ramen into his mouth. Again, it all disappeared in one swallow. I'll think even more for a third cup of. No. Stingy. Yes I am, but I don't see you paying for any of this. I could if you wanted. That would make a great story in Konoha too, how you found Naruto but let him go because he bribed you. I'll bet that goes over real well with Tsunade. I'm hoping beyond hope that no one in Konoha ever finds out about any of this. That's probably a good philosophy, even if we both know it's really unlikely. Iruka fished around for another cigarette, yeah well, a guy can dream. You know that smoking is bad for you, right? Yes I do, he said as he lit up, as you may recall, we used to have a monthly no smoking day in class where we'd spend 15 minutes talking about exactly how bad this is for your health. So how did you get hooked, then? needed a stress reliever. Naruto reached out and swatted the cigarette to the ground, there are other ways to relieve stress. Get a girlfriend or something. I was never very good with women, Naruto, and even less so since I joined the Hunter Nin. I walk down the street and all the girls just stare at me. Wait. You think it's bad when they stare? That means they dig you. Come again? You heard me. Listen Naruto, I am much older and much more experienced than you and I can tell you that women stare at me because they think I'm weird. I can see it in their eyes. I'll make you a bet, how about that? I need to get a message to Tamari, so if I win the bet then you have to go leave a note where I fought Sark and mark it with something obvious so that they'll know I'm alright. If you win, then I'll go peacefully back to Konoha with you and do all the things you want me to. Repent or whatever. Iruka almost fell over, give me the terms, he said eagerly, I'm not entering into an unreasonable bet. Now I'm trusting you here so you better play fair. I want you to go outside into a market or somewhere and introduce yourself to the best looking woman you see who's not either married or too far out of your age bracket. I'm going to bet that as long as you really try to be nice and all, you'll have a date within 10 minutes. That's absurd. But you're serious about coming back home if you lose? Completely serious. Now excited, Iruka ran and vanished outside. Minus 13 minutes later. Iruka stumbled back into the warehouse in a strange kind of daze, what did you want that sign to say, again? I have to hurry because I'm going to coffee with a woman named Roxanne. Blonde, brunette or redhead? Redhead. Ooh. How old? Two years younger than me. Care to make another bet? 
I'd be willing to accept the same terms as the previous bet, only if you lose this time you have to give me your wallet. I can think of all kinds of things we could bet on. Iruko was only paying partial attention, I don't think so, Naruto. Don't forget that you're a hunter nin, so when dealing with girls you need to dazzle them with stories of your battles. The older man searched around and found a large wooden board, lecture later, message now. I'll just carve it right into the wood. Better hurry, you have an hour to travel both ways. Dash. Tamari sat atop the highest building in hidden sand and looked out over the desert, her youngest brother standing a few paces behind her. Were it not for the master's fan on the roof at her feet, she might have been able to pass off her time with Naruto as a grandiose dream. Here she was, back in hidden sand, and nothing had changed. She would be able to wake up the next day and return straight to her previous rank and position as a genin. It was all thanks to Gara's influence, but it was still a shock to have normalcy so unexpectedly thrust upon her, who had become so used to the random and unpredictable life of outlaw. She looked down at her fan, and for one fraction of a second considered burying it deep in the desert and trying to just forget that Naruto had ever existed. But then reality sunk in, and she started to cry. They weren't the sort of over-exaggerated tears one might expect, and there was no wailing, sobbing or moaning. She just stood there as small tears traced paths down her cheeks and fell silently onto the tile roof. Gara wanted to say something, but any words of consolation would seem pathetically insignificant when measured against his sister's pain. He looked away and spoke softly, I'm sure Konkuro will be glad to see you. Yes. And all your old friends. We should invite them over or something. He got no response, but Gara took the silence to be affirmative and dissolved into sand, leaving Tamari alone on her rooftop. Dash. Iruka practically danced into the warehouse, that was great. Roxanne wants to see me again. Inside, Naruto was on his feet and looking at his reflection in one of the few unbroken windows in the building. He glanced over as the older man entered, and their eyes were level with each other, you forget to mention this one small detail. Iruka blinked, I didn't notice. It's hard to judge height when someone is laying down and I wasn't really paying attention, though I did notice that your limbs were out of proportion. Naruto surveyed his body uncomfortably and although the changes were similar in nature to the first time he had used the Shikafuge and Kai, the effects were much more pronounced. He had grown slightly taller again, and running his tongue over his fangs determined that they had again grown longer, but it took only a few more seconds of poking and prodding to reveal that his skeletal structure had become distinctly more canine. He was finding his back hunching slightly, and had a sneaking suspicion that if he were to let himself fall forward he would be able to run on all fours. Contributing to this suspicion was the fact that his arms had grown longer in proportion to the rest of his body, all of his muscles had become leaner and stringier, and his shoulders felt somehow wrong. Oi, Iruka. Dogs have disconnected shoulder bones, right? Yeah, running on all fours requires a wider range of motion, so having disconnected shoulder bones gives them more flexibility, a longer stride when running and lets them jump farther. You sure know a lot. I used to be a school teacher. They paid me to be smart. Right now they're paying you to kill me, and you haven't done that yet. I'm better at being smart than I am at killing. Not really, you're just not quite used to it yet. Wait until you're desperate enough and I bet you'll find you have a great talent for killing. Everyone does. And you call me cynical? I call them as I see them. How much money do you have? Iruka suddenly became suspicious, why? Because I need to go clothes shopping, Naruto said dully, again. There seems to be some greater power obsessed with wrecking my clothes and or wrecking my body in an effort to force me to constantly buy new garments. Stop looking at me that way. Do you have the money or not? I guess. Excellent, now give me a hand here, since I really can't move very well yet. Dash. Sark sat up against a sand dune and systematically examined his injuries. After 15 minutes of careful examination he was able to reach one conclusion. He was fucked up. Even with Leviathan's large girth shielding him from most of the chakra, he had at least three broken ribs, a snapped wrist, a broken foot, and a split lip that hurt like a bitch. Since he didn't have the luxury of regeneration like Naruto and Leviathan did, he always carried a soldier pill, but he would still have to bandage his ribs and make a splint for his foot. Looking down at Jayakur Yuu, he decided that he didn't need the extra weight, so he pressed his right hand onto the blade and watched it vanish. Dash. Somewhere in another dimension, Gamakichi was hopping happily down a river bank with his friend Yusagi the bunny. He heard a strange puffing sound and quickly looked around, what was that? Yusagi shrugged her small bunny shoulders, I don't. Splat. Gamakichi stared in wide-eyed horror at the large sword now lying on the ground where Yusagi had just been. 
and the splatter of red that was now Yusagi. Ah. Dash. Sark pondered his smoking arm. What he used to seal his sword was essentially a reverse summoning contract, so he couldn't help but wonder where exactly the weapon went when he wasn't using it. But that was a question for another day. With a grunt of pain, he started to dig in his various pockets, looking for his soldier pill. Dash. Naruto pushed his way out of the clothing store happily, wearing apparel that actually fit him. Clothes that fit are important, since wearing underwear that's three sizes too small is never a pleasant experience. His shoes had been lost somewhere in the desert, but he didn't really mind going barefoot for a while, and Iruko was starting to look annoyed at the quickly thinning pile of bills in his wallet. How are you feeling? I can barely walk, Iruka. How does it look like I'm doing? You really need to be more positive about things. Being able to move is an amazing feat for someone with your level of injuries. Amazing or not, it's still not enough. I'm helpless without my chakra. Naruto, I could cut off your arms and gouge out your eyes and you would still be a lot more dangerous than most shinobi I know. Hmm. True. Iruka's eye twitched at the boy's tone, and by the way, I'm assuming I can abandon any hope of ever getting my money back? Yeah, pretty much. Iruka really didn't know where to go from there, so more words were exchanged as they made their way back to the warehouse, and Naruto went straight back to sleep once they arrived. Dash. He felt himself being sucked back into the world of the waking by some force or another, and opened his eyes to find a large dog licking his face. Pushing the mud off him, Naruto dug around in Iruka's pack and pulled out an energy bar, unwrapping it and throwing it to the dog. There, now leave me alone. The dog jumped and caught the bar in its mouth, munched for a moment, and seemed to find it satisfactory, barking once and then running out of the warehouse. Naruto saw no sign of Iruka anywhere, and was feeling quite a bit better, though he still couldn't feel even a hint of chakra. He did a quick test of all his major muscle groups, and was pleased to find that most of them responded quite well. There was still a persistent burning sensation, but that wasn't likely to change until his chakra system started to heal itself. It was strange to think about, but he had burns all along the inside of his muscles and organs. Even more annoying was that his regeneration would be massively slowed. It was, he realized, something of a vicious circle, he needed chakra to regenerate and needed to regenerate his pathways before he could use any chakra. With a sigh, he pulled on his new vest and stretched out his arms, testing to see how extensive a range of motion his new shoulder muscles actually allowed him. He was surprised to find that he could actually rotate his arms like windmill blades, keeping them straight aligned with his torso. Once he was loosened up, he started going through some basic taijutsu routines, trying to get a feel for his new body. He would flinch every now and then when a stab of pain would shoot through one of his arms or legs, but he wouldn't let himself falter. After 20 or so minutes, he took a breather and started to heat some water to make instant ramen. Sweat ran down his face as he watched the water start to boil and lost himself in the hypnotic bubbling. He wasn't sure how much time had passed when he snapped out of it, but a good amount of water had evaporated by the time he poured it over his par-cooked noodles. Slurping loudly, he left the warehouse and started to wander through the nearby streets. He turned a corner and paused as he saw a bunch of rather large men surrounding a smaller man with very greasy hair. Is there a problem, gentlemen? Attention immediately centered on Naruto, who continued to eat his ramen. Get out of here, brat. We're just doing a little business. Naruto slurped down more noodles and gestured to the surrounded and shivering smaller man, it looks like you're being a little rough. This is none of your concern, so just walk away. When the boy showed no intention of doing so, a few of the larger men started to advance towards him. He watched them approach but held out a hand as they moved to surround him. Wait a second. Naruto tilted his head back and drank down the rest of his ramen, throwing the cup to one side. Okay, I'm ready. One of the men went to grab his arm, and without so much as a change of facial expression, Naruto caught the thug's hand and crushed it. With their companion now laying screaming on the ground, the rest of the men were slightly more hesitant. The leader, Naruto assumed, since he was the biggest and looked the meanest, stepped forward, what the hell do you want kid, money? I just want to know what's going on, and why you appear to be ganging up on someone obviously weaker than you. I'm only telling you one more time, leave. With a sigh, Naruto ducked under a punch thrown by one of the thugs who had managed to get behind him, grabbed his wrist and then threw the man into a nearby pile of trash. Two more tried to flank him, but Naruto flattened them with his all-time favorite, the scissor kick. What is it with you people and resorting to violence? All I do is go for a walk, and the next thing I know, people are attacking me. I'm injured, you know. 
those who could were now running away as fast as possible, leaving Naruto surrounded by a bunch unconscious or pitifully moaning thugs. He shrugged to himself, whatever, and continued on his walk. Dash. Sakura dropped into a chair and surveyed her kitchen table and the paper that covered it. Every day she received her mail along with all the mail addressed to the Uchiha estate, since she was the only one who cared, which she sorted to one side every day and looked through once a week. There was an unusually large amount this particular week, but she suspected most of it was junk mail. Her suspicions were for the most part confirmed, until she reached an innocuous looking letter that made do a double take. Scribed on the front of the envelope were the words, Are you Uchiha Itachi? If so, the do we have some deals for you. Thinking it must be some sort of prank, she tore it open and pulled out a single sheet of paper, which opened to reveal a form letter. Dear Uchiha Itachi. We know that life as a 19-year-old no, thank you can be hectic, particularly when you're working hard as a shinobi. It may not always be easy to eat healthy, but if you want to weigh a little less than don't know, we have some great deals on Pocky, Pocky, and even Pocky for after dinner. If any of this sounds good to you, feel free to give one of our representatives a call at 555 Fat Gone, that's 555-328. 4663. Sakura read through the letter again just to be sure she wasn't going crazy, then bolted out the door. Tsunade is not going to believe this. Dash. When Iruka got back, Naruto was doing one finger push ups, did you go out today? Hmm? Yeah, why? There's a big story going around. Apparently, there's a water shortage in the city, and most of the water supply is controlled by a guy named Crisco, who's backed by the local gangs. Now a group of cops went undercover six months ago to bust this guy, and managed to get hired as his bodyguards. Naruto didn't like where this was going. Now there were only few people in a large group of bodyguards, and today was the first day that his detail consisted of all undercover cops. They managed to get him away from the rest of his organization and were interrogating him, but just before they got him to roll. Iruka just let it hang, and Naruto flipped onto his back, well shit. So I take you were one who beat up the police? It would seem so, but I didn't know they were police at the time. Their cover was blown as soon as they confronted Crisco, so now they're screwed. They must have evidence against this guy if they followed him around all that time. Yes, but he escaped from the police and is now holed up in his fortress of a house, surrounded by minions, and sitting on top of a tank filled with water that the city needs to survive. Ouch. And once Crisco found the name of the man who had led the undercover team, he had his daughter kidnapped. Acknowledgement. And he had all the puppies and kittens in the city gathered together up and is hanging them over a pot of boiling water, threatening to drop them in. Okay, so I made that last one up. But the thing about the daughter is real? As far as I know. Naruto growled, fuck. If this Crisco was just a greedy asshole, I could let it slide, but since he plays dirty I'm going to have to something about it. What exactly are you going to do? Kill the bastard. Just like that? Just like that. What about the girl? Naruto pondered for a moment, I'll leave that you to you. Iruka stood slack-jawed as Naruto walked out of the building, then ran after him, wait a second. Dash. Crisco's mansion wasn't hard to find, since it was pretty much the largest building in the city. That, and the fact that there were a hundred or so police outside. He vaulted easily over the wall and made his way to the open front door and peeked in. He saw a few of the men from this morning most noticeably the man who Naruto had dubbed Head Thug, who was standing near the door in a police uniform and looking very nervous. Across the gigantic entrance hall, at the foot of a set of stairs was the greasy-haired man Naruto had protected this morning, surrounded by a small army of tough-looking guys armed to the teeth. There were a few more police, but they were looking scared senseless. Naruto strode in, and those who recognized him grew wide-eyed. He looked over at the big cop from this morning, Oi, you the one whose daughter was kidnapped? The man appeared to be trying very hard to restrain himself, what the fuck do you care? This is all your fault anyway. Naruto rubbed his head, okay, not getting anything from you. He looked across the room, you there, Crisco. Did you kidnap this guy's daughter? Um. Yeah. Are you threatening her life? That is the point of holding someone hostage, isn't it? Alright then, I guess I have no choice. You police guys might want to get out of the way for this. With everyone else in the room staring at him, Naruto meandered slowly towards Crisco and his cronies. Crisco scowled, listen boy, I'm grateful for your help this morning, and we'll pay you well, but stay back and let me deal with this first. Naruto continued his advance and shook his head, I'm afraid that won't be happening. 
Some of the gang members raised their crossbows, but Crisco held up a hand, what do you mean by that? The boy narrowed his eyes, I think you know exactly what I mean. The greasy-haired man snorted, well, go ahead and attack me then, but you'll find I have some very good protection. He snapped his fingers with a flourish, and the ground started to rumble as a trap door opened in the floor and smoke billowed out. Out of the smoke rose. An empty platform. Everyone stared at it for a moment, then a flushing sound could be heard from somewhere in the building. A young man in shinobi garb came through one of the doors on the second floor and jumped over the railing onto the platform, sorry. I was just in the... Crisco pointed, fight him. He looked at Naruto, whoa. I actually have someone to fight today. I may not look like much, but I almost passed the Chonin exam a couple years back, and I won't go easy on you. Naruto looked on blankly, exactly how low are your standards around here? Don't insult me. The young man formed two bunshines, and each of the three drew a kunai and they attacked Naruto from all sides. He watched them charge towards him pityingly, well, let's hope you get lucky. The three boys laughed, lucky? Naruto was attacked from the left first and dodged the kunai thrust, grabbing the boy's neck with his hand. He blocked a thrust from the right a half second later and again grabbed his neck. The third attack came from straight ahead, and he ducked under the final kunai and tore into his assailant's throat with his fangs. The forms in his left hand and teeth dissolved into smoke, leaving a quaking boy being held the air by his right hand, what do you know, your luck was good today. He looked down at Naruto shakily, and more specifically at his teeth, you re. Re. Really didn't know which was the real me? Naruto grinned, and the boy fainted dead away. He dropped him casually and turned his gaze to Crisco, anything else? The greasy man looked manic, all of you, kill him. The terrified gang members drew throwing weapons of various varieties and hurled them at Naruto, more out of self-preservation than any sense of loyalty. Just as the weapons were about to hit him, Naruto blurred and vanished. Crisco looked around desperately, above. It was far too late, as the first row of thugs were taken out by weapons they had only seconds before thrown themselves. Twisting in mid-air, Naruto planted his feet and hands on the ceiling, digging in with his claws to adhere to it. Really, Crisco. When you hire mindless minions, make sure they have good aim. At this point, Crisco's men were running for the exits as fast as they could, and the police had to get out of the way as the throng forced its way out the front door. When the mass exodus was over, the greasy man was left with his few loyal supporters. You may kill me, runt, but that policeman's daughter is going to die with me. She's probably being strangled to death in the basement even as we speak. Naruto dropped off the ceiling, again twisting to land lightly on his feet, do you have her, Iruka? The hunter nin appeared just outside the door, holding a young girl, I have her and the guards have been dealt with. As his last few men deserted him, Crisco's eyes took on a look of madness, ha. Ha. Ha 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 ha. So you think you can kill me, do you? Then we'll all die together, how about that? He pulled a stick of dynamite out of his pocket, I was going to use this on the water tank as a last resort, but it should work just as well to kill you. Everyone outside watched tensely as the madman lit the stick and waved in the air, take this. Crisco threw the explosive, and Naruto watched as it tumbled end over end toward him. He glanced down at the kunai scattered about the floor and kicked one into the air. He studied the tumbling TNT even more closely, then snatched the kunai and threw it with a small flick of the wrist. The weapon traveled through the air at an untraceable speed and embedded itself in Crisco's head with a wet thunk. The dynamite turned end over end a final few times, then Naruto caught it. The boy turned his attention to the center of the room, where a small piece of wick was burning as it floated slowly to the ground. He watched it for a couple more seconds, until it quietly burned itself out. Boom! Naruto dropped the dynamite and walked back out the mansion's front door. He stopped for a moment to check on the little girl and her father, who looked up as Naruto passed by, you can't know how much I appreciate this. Give my regards to the guys I busted up, and consider us even. With that, Iruka and Naruto vanished. While most of the cops were arresting members of Crisco's ex-gang, one got curious and went over to examine the stick of dynamite. The wick had been cleanly severed a half inch above the top of the stick, and the man's eyes then traced a path to the kunai in Crisco's head, and the small piece of wick lying on the ground in the middle of the room. Sir. You'll want to see this. Dash. When they arrived back at their warehouse, Iruka collapsed against a wall, there are no words to describe how nervous I was back there. About the mission? I was worrying about what would happen if I was caught taking an action like this without orders. Be content that you did some good today, Iruka. So after this, 
how long are you planning on staying in the city? Naruto shook his head, not long at all. Probably going to leave tomorrow morning. Why, are you planning on following me? I have to return to Konoha soon, and tomorrow is as good a time as any. So tonight is our last chance to hang out, huh? Yes it is, and you are going to do some talking. About what? You've been sick, so I've been doing all the talking, and now I want to hear about you a little bit. There's nothing really to say about me. If you need help, start with Tamari and go from there. From the impression I get, you two are getting pretty close. Naruto choked and started to cough violently, while Iruka just smiled. Dash. The next morning Iruka awoke to the smell of ramen. Figuring he owed Iruka breakfast, Naruto had made a full ten cups of instant noodles, eight for him, two for Iruka. Actually, he had taken the ramen from Iruka's pack in the first place, so all he had really done was cook it, but that was a minor issue. I'm surprised you're still here, Naruto. I would have thought you would have left as soon as you got up. Don't you have all kinds of important things to do? I'm going to dig my sword out of the desert today, and I'm not really looking forward to it, so I'm procrastinating. You do realize that it's probably under the section of desert now covered by glass? Hence the procrastination, but I want to get to hidden sand as soon as possible, and before I can do that I have to settle the score with an old man, which requires my sword. You're going to go back and fight the same guy who kicked your ass last time, but this time without chakra? I'm kind of hoping that my chakra pathways will heal before I find him. Iruka finished his breakfast and subtlety pulled a smoke from his pocket, great plan you have there. I like to improvise but are you any good at it? Naruto rolled his eyes and tossed Iruka a scroll, here you are, oh great master of sarcasm. Something for Sakura. I'm amazed, Naruto. What is it? None of your business, so just give it to her. Iruka looked at him flatly, it's not going to explode when she opens it, right? No. Release a poisonous gas? No. Start playing music from the Katamari Damacy soundtrack? God no. I would never do something that inhumane. Is it going to do anything that might get her or me in trouble? Nope, 100 safe, I guarantee it. I'm trusting you on this, so if anyone gets hurt because of this scroll. I'm not a very good person by most people's standards, but I don't lie, and I would never even consider being so underhanded as to try and hurt the village through you. We clear? Iruka looked at the ground, I'm sorry. Don't be. That line was a pretty effective conversation killer, so Naruto just helped Iruka get ready to go. Neither of them were working very fast, but all the work seemed done far too early. Iruka lifted his pack onto his back, in the grand scheme of things, you haven't been gone that long, Naruto, but somewhere along the line you leaned some maturity. The two of them walked out into the street and arbitrarily turned right, nah, I'm just really good at faking it. If you say so, but I see maturity. Anyway, are you sure you don't want to hang around a bit longer and help me dig through a few hundred metric tons of sand? No, I think my life can go on quite happily without my ever having to dig through any sand at all. And I figure it's better if we keep our time together short, we live in different worlds now. Maybe. But yesterday, you felt a little rush, didn't you? A rush? Play dumb if you want, but you know you did the right thing yesterday, and you did it without being ordered to by anyone. Tell me you didn't enjoy it even a little bit when you beat those thugs away from that little girl. There was heavy silence as Iruka realized his mouth would not open to deny it. See? I'm not going to suggest you leave the village or anything, but stand up to your superiors once in a while. It will keep them on their toes. So now you're promoting insubordination? It's part of a long-term plan to force hidden villages to reconsider how they operate. And how do you plan to get support for this mass coup of yours? Under my organizational structure, all shinobi will be given a 15-minute donut break twice a day. What if they're in the middle of a battle? It won't matter, because if I get all the villages to operate this way, both sides will take their breaks at the same time. What kind of donuts? Chocolate sprinkle. Vive la revolution. What? Sorry, historical reference. Look it up. I need to head the other way pretty soon, but I have something I want you to say to the Hokage for me when she inevitably finds out about our meeting and you have to use the exact wording. Sure, what do you want me to say? Tell her that I have no problem doing missions for Konoha again, on one condition. What's the condition? Naruto grinned, that she pay the same price as everyone else. Iruka gulped, she's going to kill me. Naruto stopped walking and started to turn around, but suddenly had an inspiration, it would be even better if Kakashi was in the room too. As a matter of detail, 
What is your price? You don't seriously think the Hokage would hire a missing nin from her own village, do you? If she were desperate enough. It had never crossed Naruto's mind that his joke might be taken seriously, so he had to think for a minute, two million yen. Iruka initially balked at the cost, but tucked the information away for a day when he might need it, so I'll see you later then, Naruto? The boy laughed, I'm sure we'll run across each other again eventually. Take care of yourself, sensei. With that they went their separate ways, and neither looked back. Iruka would make his way to Konoha without giving the scroll much thought at all, completely unaware he had in his pocket a text that would change the study of demons forever, as it contained everything Naruto knew about the history of the demon race. Dash. Sark stumbled through town, his stomach grumbling noisily. He, like Naruto, had lost most of his possessions to the shifting sands, and had only a few thousand yen. He was pondering this dilemma when he saw a group of young people doing what appeared to be dancing on the street. He watched as money changed hands, then two people would start dancing, and after a couple minutes they would stop and more money would change hands. Sark didn't know what kind of dancing it was, and had never heard that type of music, but he knew a competition when he saw one, hey, you kids over there, can I try? There were a few snickers, but one of the boys held up his hand, sure, old man, I'll take you on. What odds? There was some muttering, then someone whispered something in the same boy's ear, 20, 1. The old man counted his money, I'll bet 9,000 yen on myself, then. Full-fledged laughter broke out, but a few courageous people put money down for Sark to win, usually because their friends dared them too. The old man took his place across from the cocky teen and someone started up the boombox. Seven minutes later. Sark walked away with a large bag on money, leaving a number of gaping jaws and one crushed ego behind him. Remember, kiddies, never underestimate a geezer. Two boys near the edge of the crowd watched the old man walk away. Dude. Did that guy just do a disco to rap music? Aha. Uh -huh. I didn't know that was rhythmically doable. Me neither. It was a damn good dance, wasn't it? Yep. Think he'd teach us the disco? Dash. Naruto surveyed the field of glass morosely. Having been unconscious the last time he was here, he hadn't actually seen the glass field as uncontrolled chakra had spontaneously formed. It was big. Really big. Like. Sark's sword kind of big. Obviously he would have to rethink his plan of systematically digging in the desert. If he wanted to find his sword, some use of the mush between his ears would be required. So he sat down, and pondered. What did he know about glass? Though technically a liquid, it existed as a solid for all intents and purposes, so no help there. Despite looking like a crystal, glass was also amorphous, which meant that the atoms had no order or structure, so speaking atomically it had more in common with cotton candy than anything crystalline. Interesting as this fact was, again Naruto couldn't think how it would be useful. But then the wanderings of his mind brought him to something Kisame had taught him by the campfire one night, and it had to do with resonance. All substances have specific frequencies at which they will vibrate, the lowest of which being the resonant length. Kisame had told him that if one were to create a vibration very near to, but not exactly, that frequency, the glass would shake itself apart. This effect, although boring in theory, was really fun to do in practice, since when a scientist says glass shakes itself apart, what he really means is that it shatters violently. And that was exactly what Naruto needed to do. How on earth did Kisame learn something like that? Naruto lurched at the voice and fell onto his back, that you, bastard fox? Are there any other dashingly handsome demons currently forced to cohabitate with you inside your head? Cause if there are I'd love to meet them, it gets lonely in here. See, I knew it was you. The why did you ask? So I would have time to collect myself after the surprise of having you talk after being quiet for so long. I'm more surprised than you are, brat. I've been trying and failing to get your attention for a couple days, and I went to some pretty extreme lengths. I had a really weird dream last night, and it included you singing Candy Girl. And thus awkwardness ensued. So you really were singing Candy Girl? I thought you might be just ignoring me, so I tried to come up with the most annoying thing I could think of. You were right. I didn't sleep very well at all last night. Back to my initial question, how does Kisame know about something like resonance? He has many hobbies, one of which is science that involves breaking shit. I'm just quoting what he told me one day, but anyway, on to more important things. I don't suppose you would be so lucky as to have any space in which to manifest? I don't, but even if I did, you can't give me anywhere near enough chakra in the pathetic state you're in right now. 
You could have stopped after saying that you didn't have any space. I could have, but I derive great pleasure from pointing out your insufficiencies. If you can't manifest, we really will have to use vibrations. I can oscillate my body with a very small amount of chakra, but I'm not sure how accurate I can be in controlling the frequency. How much chakra are we talking here? As of now I have pretty much none. If you have enough to maintain a connection with me, I can probably draw enough to shake things up a bit, even if you can't feel it. Focusing with all his might, Naruto felt what might have been the tiniest hint of chakra, but he would have to trust the QB on this one. Strangely, that thought wasn't very comforting. With a self-resigned sigh, Naruto lay down on the glass and placed his ear against it, then lightly ran one claw over the glass surface in slow circles. The sound created was complex, full of overtones, but Naruto listened very carefully and soon isolated the frequency he needed. Oi, bastard, can you hear that? Having immersed himself in the boy's mind, the QB could indeed hear it, and started to hum throatily, trying to match the pitch. When the demon had it, he drew on just the tiniest bit of chakra and, deep under the surface of the glass desert, Sere Kirite started to shake. It took a little while for the QB to get it exactly right, and as soon as he did, Naruto jumped away and clamped his hands on his ears as the glass resonated, massively amplifying the sound and turning the desert into a giant speaker. He wasn't sure how long he would be able to stand it, but after just a couple seconds the QB varied the frequency a teeny tiny bit. 300 feet away from Naruto's position, a section of the glass desert shattered, launching the sword into the air. The boy ran forward as it landed and skittered across the ground, grabbed it up and slid to a stop. Hey Fox, remind me to pick up some sodium if we ever some across a place that sells it. Why? For Kisame, we owe him one. It's pretty much his favorite stuff on the planet, but Itachi won't let him keep it around. What would he want with a lump metal? Sodium ignites upon contact with water. Like makes a little fire ignites or explodes ignites? Naruto leaned his blade comfortably against his shoulder, a half pound of sodium dropped in water can level a small building, assuming you have enough water. We definitely need some of that stuff. The boy laughed, we can get some for our own personal use too, then. Preparing to head back to ocean, Naruto took a moment to admire Irika's sign. It was just a wooden board with a simple message telling Tamari he was okay, but it made him feel better after having not seen her for what felt like far longer than the few days it had really been. There was a part of him that wanted to just run all the way to hidden sand right then, not stopping until he collapsed at her feet. But Naruto could feel in his bones that Sark was still somewhere nearby, and he couldn't leave their fight unfinished. Reigning in his emotions, Naruto set off yet again across the desert. Dash. Leaning in and surveying the room, Tamari tried her best to cheer up. In her time with Naruto she had steadily forgotten more and more of her old life, but seeing all the people she had grown up with gathered all together almost brought a smile to her face. Gara had gathered everyone an hour or so ago, and they had all patiently waited for her, chatting among themselves and keeping quiet even though many of them could sense her hovering just outside the door. Finally rallying her courage, she pushed the door open, walked in, and found herself immediately swamped. Some were happy with just a handshake, but many insisted on hugs and it seemed like every person in the room wanted nothing more than to make her feel better after what many called her terrifying ordeal. It swiftly became apparent that no one in hidden sand had even the slightest clue about what she had really been doing all this time, and so she mostly just nodded to whatever they said and accepted the raw sympathy everyone seemed to be exuding. That was, until she got to Bando. Now Bando really wasn't a bad guy, and she had known him all her life, but he was somewhat lacking in the tact department. As she passed, he gave her a hearty thump on the back, glad to see you, Tem. Guess it was a stroke of luck that bum who was holding you got whacked, huh? The change in the atmosphere was palpable as Tamari stiffened and her chakra flared. Bando started to slowly take a step backwards, but was suddenly helped along by Tamari's fist, which sent him flying through the air and out the window. There was a moment of shock as everyone in the room tried to figure out what had just happened. Tamari, like most all San shinobi who used battle fans, was quite well known for being physically weak. Bando wasn't a huge man by anyone's standards, but he was at least 180 pounds it required quite a lot of force to send 180 pounds flying across a large room. One of her old academy teachers laughed quietly, been working out a little, Tamari-san? The sand girl was quiet for a moment, surprised to find that the random act of violence actually made her feel better. She reveled in the adrenaline rush for a few moments, then walked through a parting crowd over to the broken window and looked out, are you okay? I. I think I broke my leg in the fall. Can you move? No. Perfect. 
Tamari felt energized for the first time in days, and there was a little more bounce in her step as she walked away from the window and the feeble whining coming through it. Kankuro pushed open the door to the kitchen and emerged carrying a tray of hors d'oeuvres, his stuffed mouth suggesting he had sampled a few already, wash going on? Why she few one though quiet? Dash. Sark walked into the hospital and looked around, grabbing a doctor as he passed by, hey, I need some medicine to speed the healing of broken bones. I'm sorry sir, but I'm busy right now and. The old man held out his bag of money, is this enough? The doctor stuttered, I. I'm sorry sir, but we don't just hand out valuable medicine to anyone who asks. Where's the nearest discotheque? The nearest what? The place where the young people go to dance. Leave the hospital and turn left, go a couple blocks down, turn left on main, go a few more blocks and it's on your left. A place called Ziggy's. Thanks. Sark let go of the doctor and quickly left the hospital. Minus 20 minutes later. The old man walked back into the hospital with two huge sacks and found that same doctor. Okay, I have more money now. Give me the medicine. The doctor stared at the sacks of money for a couple seconds and drooled a little, of course, sir, right this way. We have many fine brands of product to help speed healing, and you'll be ship shape in no time. No bullshit sales pitches or fake courtesy please, doctor. Just give me the best stuff you have and I'll be on my way. His rather harsh tone took some of the wind out of the doctor's sails, but Sark had his medicine within five minutes in the form of a salve. Just rub that on the injured area liberally, the doctor said, and anything broken or bruised should heal in a couple of hours tops. Thanks, your help has been appreciated. Leaving his sacks of money behind, the old man walked out the automatic doors. Dash. Walking the streets of ocean with his sword, Naruto felt his body drain of tension he hadn't even noticed before then. Despite their mutual dislike for each other, both Naruto and Kyuubi derived a sense of comfort from the other's presence. For Naruto the Kyuubi was his power and source of, usually sarcastic and snide, wisdom, while the demon had Naruto to thank for his life and the few freedoms he enjoyed. The boy continued to contentedly wander, knowing that he would feel Sark's presence if he ever got close. Normally he would never be so brash, but the one advantage of not having any chakra flow was that no one could sense him. Anyone who saw him, even other shinobi, would not be able to distinguish him from a normal man. Or rather, a normal man with claws, fangs, facial markings that looked like strange tribal tattoos, and a sword large enough to bisect a cow. So maybe he wasn't going to be very inconspicuous, but in a relatively large city like Ocean, they weren't very likely to run across each other, and that was only if Sark was even in the city, but Naruto still kept a small part of his brain alert in case of attack. Having had no real direction in mind, he just let his feet take him wherever they wanted to, and after an hour or so he unconsciously made his way to the police station. Upon realizing where he was, Naruto immediately ducked into a side street and scaled a fire escape, doing his best not to draw attention to himself. Once he was safely on top of an office building across from the precinct, Naruto took a moment to try and figure out what on earth had possessed him to go to the one place in the city where all the people who could recognize him would gather and came up blank, but even then he felt compelled. Performing a quick henge into his usual disguise of Sasuke, a fact for which he was sure the Uchiha was going to yell at him some day, his knees almost buckled as his whole body burned with a sharp pain. You know, I never get tired of watching you do stupid things. Not ever. Ignoring the fox, Naruto hid his sword in an obscure corner of the roof and went back over to the fire escape, sliding down to the ground. He had left the Uchiha fans that adorned Sasuke's shirts out of his henge, since having been primarily a clan of police, they would probably be well known among their law enforcing counterparts. Trying to look innocuous, Naruto walked casually over to the station and pushed open one of the double doors, immediately taking inventory of his environment. He was somewhat surprised to find none of the air of suspicion he would have suspected so soon after an officer's daughter being kidnapped. In fact, things seemed somewhat jovial. Everything was polished and looking shiny, a janitor mopping the floor was singing a little ditty to himself, and everyone moving around in the lobby seemed to have a little extra bounce in their steps. Rather at a loss as to what to do, Naruto went over to the display cases and started searching for faces he knew, quickly finding the one he was looking for. Naruto had, during their first meeting, Called this man the head thug, but looking at a picture of him in his full uniform, there was nothing thuggish about him at all and Naruto felt just a little guilty about having so brashly used such a moniker. Shifting his attention to the nameplate, he was able to apply the more correct title of Hidori Katsu. Catching the eye of the receptionist, Naruto walked over and smiled politely, Hello there, I heard a friend of mine got in trouble the other day. His name is Hidori Katsu and. Oh, 
Yes. His daughter. Well, I'm not supposed to tell anyone about the specifics, but you can ask him yourself. He's probably in the break room, so I'll have to page him. The receptionist picked up a small microphone and spoke into it, her voice echoing through the building, Officer Hidori to the front desk please, Hidori to the front desk. Fighting the urge to twitch nervously, Naruto settled on just pacing slowly back and forth until one of the doors leading to the lobby opened and the man himself came through, glancing at Naruto then at the receptionist, can I help you with something? Naruto tried for a friendly look, hey, Katsu, it's been a while. Do I know you, sir? The receptionist looked at Naruto with a bit of distrust, this young man said he was a friend of yours. Hidori looked about to deny it, but Naruto interrupted, you don't have to be this cold, Katsu, I thought I'd made up for the alley incident. Didn't we agree to call it even? Gears started to turn in the policeman's head and he suddenly smiled semi-exaggeratedly, well, you did cause a pretty big mess. Thus ensued a round of nervous laughter. As the receptionist sighed to herself and went back to work, Naruto gestured with his head for the policeman to follow him out the door. Once they were on the street, the boy found himself the target of a bombardment odd questions, starting with, who on earth are you? See. That's a complicated question, but I'm not going to be anything but peaceful. You can't expect me to just take your word for it. What happened to gratitude? Don't get me wrong, but a lot of cops saw what you're capable of, and someone of your power just wandering around our city makes a lot of us nervous. You guys get nervous way too easily then, but I'll be gone soon. I just wanted to meet you. Hidori looked slightly taken aback, you wanted to meet me? Is there something strange about that? We have a few shinobi posted in the city from Hidden Sand, and they probably wouldn't even talk to me. It would break the chain of command. Naruto laughed humorlessly, trust me when I say that I'm not the kind of person to worry about something like that. My only motive is curiosity, and I have no superior to report to. So is this your real form? Nah, just a henge. So that bestial form was. Yep, me in all my glory, but I don't want to keep you away from your work. Oh, I wasn't working. We were actually having a little party of sorts. With Crisco gone, the crime rate is already dropping through the floor, and someone made the joke that now they'll have to lay off half the police. Naruto leaned against the wall of the building, would you mind if I hung out for a little while? What? Everything in Naruto's head told him not to say what he was about too, you said you were having a party, and I could use a party right now. Just say I'm a family friend or something. That sounds great, but you're not going to answer any more questions, are you? If you really want to know, do a little digging through your logs of missing Nin. Hidori pushed open the precinct door, I was already planning on it. Dash. Naruto waved at the rabbit, hello, Bunny-san. The small furry creature hopped over to him, hello, Naruto, how are you today? Pretty good, though the world seems a bit blurry. Ah, but Naruto, that's because you're drunk. Hey. Silly rabbit, I can't get drunk. No you are most definitely drunk. I think there might have also been something in those brownies you ate. But my chakra burns all the alcohol and other crap out of my system. Naruto blinked. Shit. The rabbit nodded authoritatively, see, I told you. So what do I do now? Oh, you'll just have to wait it out, and I'm afraid you'll have to do it alone. We hallucinogenic bunnies are in high demand these days. Okay then, bye bye. See you later, Naruto. The rabbit disappeared in a swirl of color and Naruto looked around the room, he he. Things are spinning. Dash. Naruto ambled out of the police station, flinching as the sun hit his eyes, man. When he said party I thought he meant a bunch of cops eating donuts and drinking coffee. You owe me another one, brat. I maintained your henge for you when you were out of it, which was most of the night. And I'll bet you were enjoying every minute of it. Hell yes. I particularly liked the part when you danced with the stripper on the table. To his horror, Naruto did remember something to that effect, you've got to promise me never to tell Tamari. We'll see about that. Damn it, why didn't you snap me out of it before I got in over my head? Bah. You need to let loose once in a while or you get all tense and act like even more of a jackass than usual. Plus, it's fun watching drunk people. Naruto stumbled across the street and climbed up onto the roof where he had left his sword. I'd shoot back a clever comeback, but my head hurts too much. Finally able to let his henge slip, Naruto lay down next to his sword and closed his eyes, I'm gonna take a little nap, okay? You don't need my permission. Hmm. Not really listening, Naruto drifted off, dreaming of a world where his head didn't feel like it was splitting open.
Dash. As alarm bells went off all around him, Naruto bolted upright and snatched up his blade, Fox. What the hell is going on? I don't know. Everything was completely peaceful until about five seconds ago. Running to the edge of the roof and peeking over, the mayhem confirmed QB's statement. Everyone was running around haphazardly with no apparent idea what was going on, but police were pouring out of the station and running down the street, so Naruto followed along the rooftops. As the procession of cops led Naruto through what was beginning to be a disturbingly familiar part of the city, Naruto dropped down into the street and grabbed a man who was running the other way, Hey! What's going on here? The man gasped, some freak just ruptured Crisco's water tank. God knows how he got past the police but he did, and now he's just standing there as the water runs onto the ground. Then why hasn't anyone stopped him? The man started to sob, we tried, but he has this sword and. That was all Naruto needed to hear. He jumped with all his strength and landed on a roof half a block away, already bracing for another jump. People turned to look as he tore across the rooftops towards Crisco's mansion. As he approached, he could see a ring of police surrounding the house as the people who weren't running away looked on in horror as the water they needed to survive formed a slowly growing pool on the ground. Naruto landed in the mansion's courtyard, ignoring the water that started to seep into his shoes. Sark. Where are you? There was dead silence, then a small splash. Naruto rotated his arm back with a snap and stopped Jayakur Yuu an inch from his neck, flinching as the blade dug into his palm. That was dirty, old man. We seniors have to take every opportunity we get, Naruto. The boy brought Kirite to bear as Sark lashed out with a kunai, and Naruto was forced to release his hold on Jayakur Yuu to catch the old man's other arm. So now they were deadlocked, blade against blade and hand against hand. Naruto growled, how can you even hold that sword with one hand? Oh, I just eat my Wheaties every morning and never drink alcohol or smoke. Bull. Pushing with all his strength, Naruto started to overpower his opponent. Sark ducked and suddenly broke away as Naruto toppled forward. Rather than try to regain his balance, the jump forward into a roll in the ground he had previously occupied was torn up. Flipping back onto his feet Naruto immediately broke to one side as Jayakuryu again barely missed him. He brought Kubikiri around for a low hamstring slice and at the same time Sark went for a follow-up decapitation. Naruto ducked and the old man jumped as both continued to spin, keeping up their momentum for a full 360 their blades clashing again with a grinding sound as the two again found themselves deadlocked. This all happened in a period of just a couple of seconds, and the large crowd of onlookers was completely speechless. Naruto glared up at the old man, fully aware of his situation. With all these people around, using jutsus could become extremely hazardous, and if either fighter used any offensive jutsu, even a low-level one, the other would be forced to respond in kind, thus creating escalation. On one hand, being forced to use nothing but taijutsu was good for Naruto, who could still only use a small amount chakra, but at the same time it meant that. As expected, Sazerk suddenly blurred out of existence. Naruto didn't think for a second that Sark had ruptured the tank just to draw him out, the old man was too nice for that, but he needed the water to boost his speed. And man did it boost his speed. Sark came down with a diagonal slash from Naruto's blind spot and the boy just barely escaped with a nick shoulder. Without missing a beat Sark attacked again, opting for a straight cross cut. Escaping narrowly again, Naruto suddenly turned and ran away. The old man was stumped for a second, then gave chase. Just as he was almost to the doors of Crisco's mansion, the boy suddenly slammed his sword into the dirt in front of him and planted his feet against it. The blade flexed like horizontal springboard and Sark skidded to a stop as Naruto was launched straight towards him and hit the old man with a very unshinobi-like but still very effective flying tackle. Jayakuryu went flying as Naruto and Sark hit the mud, the old man grabbing Naruto's shoulders and kicking kicking the boy with both feet, flipping him over and sending him skidding through the mud following the massive sword. They were a little scuffed up, but on their feet in fractions of a second and back at each other. Sark drew a pair of large kunai without much hope of them being able to stand up to Naruto's claws, but he wasn't planning on going long without his sword. Figuring that for once he had an advantage, Naruto immediately went on the offensive, being careful to not move too quickly and give his opponent a chance to slip by him. If the old man went straight for his sword with Naruto directly in his way, it would leave him open no matter how fast he was. Unlike typical shinobi battles, which are typically fast and bloody, two swordsmen facing off against each other involves a lot of waiting and watching. Naruto advanced slowly, his entire being focused on Sark, waiting for the old man to make his move. The boy was just taking his eleventh step when he saw Sark start to shift. 
He thought the old man was going to go left, but he had to be absolutely sure. His pupils dilated and he could suddenly see through the faint, masterful as it was. He broke right and Sark, immediately sensing his ploy had been detected, tried in vain to reverse direction at the last moment. The two clashed, Sark scoring a light hit on Naruto's shoulder but paying for it dearly when the boy's claws raked down his side. Breaking away and diving for his sword, the old man forced Naruto to do the same unless he wanted fight against Jayakuryu with his bare hands. Grabbing Sere Kirite as he ran by, Naruto jumped out of the mud and landed on the house next to the now deceased Kriskos. Sark stood below him, unwilling to leave the advantage of the water and confident that Naruto wouldn't waste any time, as the tank was still slowly draining. The boy obviously knew this, and worked his mind furiously trying to come up with a plan. A straight sword battle between him and Sark might take hours, and he had to finish it soon. He felt for his chakra and could now draw on more than any normal human, but still only a mediocre amount for someone like him. He would lose in an ninjutsu battle, sucked at genjutsu way too much to even try that, and didn't have time for a drawn-out straight taijutsu match. So it was time to get creative. The biggest problem he was facing was the issue of water, because the more drained from the tank the stronger Sark got, to say nothing of how much it might cripple the city. He was desperately puzzling over this conundrum when the astoundingly simple answer suddenly came to him in a flash of insight. He flashed through seals with the ease of someone who had done them a thousand times, and molded a huge amount of chakra, Kirigakura no Jutsu. The old man caught on a moment too late as all the water on the ground suddenly evaporated into mist, and a violent explosion rocked the house as the tank ruptured, all the water therein having also been transformed by the Jutsu. Sark felt a momentary stab of regret as the water surrounding his feet also vaporized, cancelling his speed jutsu. He had been hoping for things to last a bit longer. Sensing that Naruto had left his rooftop perch and was now stalking him through the mist, Sark raised Jayakur Yuu and charged forward. Naruto blocked his first strike and the two slid into their respective stances, attacking, blocking, parrying and counterattacking in a flurry of strikes, flowing from one to the next with no delay or hesitation. It was a battle of wills where the slightest insecurity would mean death, and neither faltered in the slightest, Naruto's more brash and offensive style countering but not able to overpower Sark's sweeping defensive slices. They moved through the mist like phantoms, making no sound with their movements as their blades clashed again and again. Every second felt like an hour, every minute like a day, but neither would concede. It would have been easy for one of them to break away, giving them both a chance to rest, but that might leave the first to retreat open to attack a position that couldn't be risked. So they continued on. A particularly powerful stroke of Jayakuryu cleared the mist, and for a second or two, the two fighters could actually see each other. Naruto had a serious expression that showed his complete and total focus on the fight, but the boy was slightly disturbed to see that Sark was smiling. Their eyes met for a fraction of a second, and the old man abruptly changed the rhythm of the battle. He broke away and then attacked from a different angle, catching Naruto off guard with a forward thrust. The boy couldn't block it, and he knew it, but was going to try anyway, bringing his blade around at what he knew to be far too slow a speed. He watched the sword close in, and Naruto suddenly jerked as control of his body was torn from him. Dash. Sark looked down at form kneeling in front of him, this is foolishness, and I want no part in it. But why? You are too weak. Your coup will fail, and my only regret is that there are people stupid enough to follow you to their deaths. We could win easily if you helped us everyone would rally around you. Why would I help you? Why would I help a self-proclaimed devil gain control of an entire country? I am a devil, Sark, but I'm one you helped to create. And besides, I don't care about politics and all that crap, but I care about keeping the country strong, and the scum who run things now care about nothing but their own fat useless selves. I am a shinobi of hidden mist, and I will defend it against anyone who threatens it, no matter the circumstances. Sark glared as the man who had once been his greatest student rose and faced him, fine then. I thought I taught you better than this. You are acting like a petulant child. I am going to take this country over, old man, and there will come a time when you realize I was right to do it. Get out of my sight, Momochi. You are a disgrace to me and to our sword style. Zabuza turned away, you're right about my being weak, but I won't be weak forever. One day I'm going to make you eat those words. You think you'll ever be my equal? I doubt you'll even survive this pathetic rebellion of yours. The demon of the mist paused mid-step and grinned sardonically, then I'll strike at you from the depths of hell. Dash. There was a wet thunk as Jayakuryu hit the mud, and all was still. Sark held his paralyzed and only partially attached sword arm with his other hand and let out a sigh, that was spectacular, 
Naruto-kun. A half-twist parry followed up by a quick backhand slash. Tell me, do you ever remember learning a form like that? No, but at the time it was just a means of stopping your sword from connecting with my skull. The old man winced as he squeezed his wound in an attempt to slow the bleeding, that defensive counterattack is the best one that I ever came up with, and I only taught it to one of my students, Sark laughed, he was never very good at it though, that fool. Naruto ran his thumb over the hilt of Sere Kirite, so is that it, old man? Jayakuryu vanished in a puff of smoke, today is your victory, Naruto-kun. Strangely enough, I don't mind the feeling of losing. Short as it was, the battle was magnificent, and I haven't enjoyed myself so much since. Well, never. But you'll leave me alone now? Of course. You shall never be bothered by me again. Good. Except. Naruto narrowed his eyes, except what? If you ever want a rematch, you know where to find me. Minus three days later. Tamari sighed as she sunk into her bath, a rare and treasured commodity in hidden sand. Citizens were allowed one bath every three months, but since Gara never took any, he had allowed Tamari to go in his stead. The last few days had actually been semi-bearable, with her newly gained respect among her peers and Bando having spent almost an hour apologizing. There was even the occasional period of five or so minutes where she didn't think about Naruto. She smiled slightly as she thought of the people who were trying so hard to cheer her up, particularly Gara and Konkuro, who were willing to go to sometimes ridiculous lengths. She was reaching reaching for the soap when there was a sudden violent knocking on the door, Tamari-sama. If you even think about coming in here I'm going to tear you in half. What do you want? The door, which had started to open, snapped shut again, I'm very sorry, but there seems to be some sort of disturbance at the south entrance. It seems there's a man who's been inquiring as to your location. Why is that a problem? Well, he was carrying a large sword, and one of the gate guards insisted on inspecting it. Tamari was on her feet in an instant, almost falling over getting out of the tub, and rushed to get dressed, not bothering to dry off. She flung open the door as she was pulling on her shirt and ignored the chonin on the other side, running straight down the hall towards the exit. She wasn't sure why Sark would have followed her to Hidden Sand, but she wasn't about to be a burden on the village. It wasn't very far to South Gate, but she needed to get her gear from her room, which was going to send her a couple blocks out of the way. All in all, Tamari figured she had maybe two minutes, so she would have to hurry. Her bedroom window was open, so she dove in head first, rolled to a stop with her hand grabbing her fan. It wasn't until she was halfway turned around to jump back out the window that she realized someone else was in the room. Dash. At the south gate, a hundred or so shinobi had the intruder cornered up against a building. The highest ranking person present was a Kunoichi Anbu captain, so she took a few steps forward from the group. Who are you, and why do you insist on being senselessly violent? Well, actually, I just kind of enjoy senseless violence. Now I have a question, he smiled fangly and held out his weapon, don't you think this is a sexy sword? The silence was deafening. I mean seriously, if you were to see this sword just laying at the side of the road, don't you think you'd suddenly have an incredible urge to run your hot hands over it? The various Anbu collectively took a couple steps back as their captain's self-control started to waver, now as I was saying, about your intentions here. And then you could take it home so you could grind up against it just for the sheer joy of rubbing your body against a sword as sexy as this. At this point, a storm of kunai, shuriken, and various other sharp pointy things converged on the poor cornered intruder, but he appeared undaunted as a red chakra flared up blasted all the projectiles back without any effort. Nice try, but not nearly good enough. Might I recommend some explosive tags next time? Dash. Tamari's training kicked in and she tore a kunai from her holster and threw it blindly towards the only corner of the room where someone could be hiding. Now I have to say, that wasn't the kind of welcome I was expecting. As the voice registered, her body suddenly stopped responding, and she could only stare as Naruto walked over and amusedly flicked her forehead, you do realize that if I were someone else using a henge you'd be dead right now, right? Surreal as it was, the first question that popped into her head was, how did you get in here? The fox is creating a distraction of sorts, so I just hopped over the wall and found where you live. But. I'm pretty sure I have Anbu watching me. You did, hence the distraction involving the bastard fox saying he was looking for you. It drew all your watchers and guards like Itachi to Paki. They just looked at each other for a second, then Tamari punched him in the stomach as hard as she possibly could. Ow. I thought you were dead. How could you stay away this long and not even try to contact me? Now at this point. Naruto could have mentioned that he did leave a message, 
and that it wasn't his fault she didn't get it, but that probably would have been insensitive and she might have hit him again, so he held his peace. I promised you I'd come back alive, didn't I? Yes, but. There are no buts when it comes to my promises. Ever. Tamari stared at him for a second, how is it that you managed to make such a blatantly arrogant statement so comforting? It's part of my charm. For all her efforts, Tamari felt her anger at him slipping away, but she suddenly noticed something odd, is there any particular reason you're standing six feet away and avoiding looking directly at me? That depends, because there are two options here. You might have just gotten a lot more comfortable around me, but I think it's more likely that you haven't noticed yet that your clothes are completely soaked through. Tamari blinked. And rather clingy, I might add. Her ears went bright red. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. Her voice was slightly strained, could you turn around, please? Dash. The demon posed dramatically, no, Christy, you can't leave. He switched to a high squeaky voice, but I must, Jack. See. I'm your sister. Back to his low dramatic voice, no. How can this be? An Anbu lieutenant sidled up to his commander, at this point sir, I think he's just mocking us. She looked over to where QB, in his usual Sasuke-ish from, was reading aloud from Icha Icha Paradise, a new beach of love, and then looked back at her lieutenant, that's a very insightful observation you make there. The lieutenant grinned like an excited puppy, thank you. I was being sarcastic. Oh. There was a gap in conversation, then a sob could be heard from the crowd of San Nin, and one of the Cho Nin started to get teary-eyed, I'm sorry. But I just can't help it. It's so sad. Jack and Christy love each other, but they both know it can never be. This performance is so touching. An eyebrow started to twitch, I am commander of the Anbu, respected by all. I am not going to lose my cool. I am not going to lose my cool. I am not going to. QB used the squeaky voice, I don't care, Jack, I don't care. Even if we are siblings, I must have you. The commander's control almost snapped as the entire crowd of Shinobi, including her personally trained Anbu, collectively gasped in shock, and she started to massage her temple slowly. Dash. Tamari, now dry, emerged from her bathroom to find Naruto sprawled on her bed staring blankly at the ceiling. Making yourself at home? He spared a glance in her direction, yes, thank you. I'm a bit tired, since I really haven't slept for three days now. What could you possibly have been doing? Recondensing a numerous square miles of mist into thousands of gallons of water. I trust that Teresa Long and involved story there, but I probably couldn't give less of a damn about it right now. That's about what I figured. Shoving him over slightly, Tamari lied down and rested her head on his chest, listening to his heartbeat. When she spoke, her voice had none of its usual vitality. I really thought you were dead. I honestly believed it after seeing that desert of glass. I know. You beat him, right? Yeah, I beat him. So what now? Naruto let out a slow breath, that depends on you. On me? I can't stay in hidden sand for very long, so if you decide to remain here then. Naruto was cut off as Tamari pinched his side, listen, after this last mess, you'll be lucky if I let you out of my sight for a few months. Well then, we don't have to meet Itachi and Kisame for some time yet, so I'd like to visit the country of the wave. Country of the wave? Yeah. I figure we a base of operations somewhere, and wave country has no shinobi, it's relatively out of the way, plus I like it there, so I thought I might buy up some real estate. You're not worried about being vulnerable if we stay in one place? I intend to take safety precautions, but I'm not overly concerned. There are a lot of politicians who have far more numerous and powerful enemies than I do, and none of them have a tenth my power, yet they sleep contentedly in their own houses. You've thought this through, it seems. I've been rolling the idea around in my head for a while now. But we can stay here for tonight, right? You're not planning on going anywhere? Naruto laughed and rolled Tamari off him, leaning over to steal a quick kiss, tonight, I don't even plan on moving from this spot. Dash. Konkuro pushed open his front door to find his brother sitting on their couch looking strained, Hey Gara, what are you doing? Nothing. I looks like Naruto's alive. I know. What? How? He's upstairs. Konkuro did a little mental figuring, and you're doing nothing? Gara nodded, absolutely nothing. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I'm thinking we should get you out of the house. Hell, I don't think I want to be in the house. Where would we go? 
we could go watch a demonic sword transformed into Uchiha Sasuke recite his own rendition of a porn novel in monologue. I'm assuming this is one one of those things that makes more sense when you see it? Not really, but I kind of enjoy watching the commander of the Anbu tear out her hair. Gara stood up slowly and forced himself to walk out the front door as Kankuro continued talking, and for what it's worth, the demon is pretty good with his different voices. The End